Okay, chairs, would you, would you turn on your video and do a mic check? Chair Cabrera? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna turn My check. Door. My check. Great. You're good. Okay, uh, Sergeant, you could start the recording. And Owen, you could give the opening. Good afternoon. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good, good afternoon. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. And I, I just ask everyone to bear with me. I, um, I scratched my cornea uh, and it's been a very difficult couple of days and I'm struggling with it. Um, I'm grateful that we might be able to get uh, Councilmember Cabrera as a co-chair. Um, extremely grateful. Thank you so much, Cabrera, for always uh, showing up and being helpful. And I apologize to everyone. I'm gonna be on as much as possible, but might be disconnected. Um, uh, because of just needing to like <laughs> put uh, put something on my eye. But good afternoon. I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso, and I am the chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Welcome to this hearing on introductions 1942 and 1943, sponsored by Council Member Powers and myself to create minimum number of organic waste drops offsite and community recycling centers throughout each district in New York City. Thank you to Councilmember Powers for working together with me on this important package of legislation um, and for allowing me to be a part of the legislation. I just want to note that uh, Councilmember Powers has thought about the concept and allowed me to be a partner with him on this um, issue. And I'm extremely grateful to him for that. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in our city has been both tragic and financially devastating. The residential collection of organic waste and temporarily halted on May 4th, 2020, with no plans to resume service until at least June 30th, 2021. Food scrap drop-off sites were also temporarily suspended with no indication of when these sites will resume. E-waste curbside collection was suspended and hazardous waste special collections programs were suspended at least one year. For 2021, these program cuts amount to about 21.1 million for curbside collection, 3.5 million for community compost programs, 3.5 million for e-waste curbside collection and 2.1 million for hazardous waste programs and 2.1 million for recycling outreach, including Grow NYC's food scrap, drop off and green market textile programs. I understand that we must achieve budget savings, but I also know that we cannot remove access to recycling programs and still pretend that we are going to achieve zero waste. Some of these programs are New Yorkers only opportunities to dispose of waste safely and legally uh, there are disposal regulations for hazardous materials and electronic waste that will be significantly more difficult to follow if these programs are suspended without replacement. Organic waste discarded as refuse also increases our greenhouse gas emissions and reduces our access to compost and valuable alternative energy. All of this is vital to our entire city and most profoundly our economic environmental justice communities. Communities that have been feeling the effects of lack of of our lack of progress and some who have lived side by side with transfer stations should be given every opportunity to reduce the amount of waste that they are sending to landfill. We cannot allow a short term fiscal crisis to leave us unprepared for the far for the far larger crisis of climate change. I look forward to hearing the SNY testimony on how we can build on these bills and advance recycling in New York City. I also want to hear from advocates about how we can build on the work they are already doing. I hope that we can work together to create a system that will actually reduce our waste. Uh, I like. I would like uh, to ask Councilmember Powers to give an opening statement, and would like to just, um, I guess, uh, to 
to however much power I have as chair um, empower Council Member Cabrera to, to um, from now on just take on chairing this committee. Again, thank you so much, Cabrera. And thank you guys for, uh, for bearing with me as I read with one eye. I, I wanna use that as the excuse as to why I wasn't, I wasn't reading well, but uh, <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Member Cabrera, I mean, Council Member Powers. Thank you, I'm Chair, Chair Reno. So I, I feel your pain from here, my friend. So I, I hope you're doing okay. And we certainly, I think everybody understands and, and, and recognizes that you are, you're probably uh, not in your best condition to chair today, but thank you for your leadership and partnership on this issue. I know you care deeply about our recycling and composting system here in the city on waste issues. You've been a leader here in the council since I've been here. You also sit next to me, so we get to talk about this in person when we do see each other. But I'm thrilled to join you in, um, in the chair in introducing the Community Organics and Recycling and Power Act, or we're calling the CORE Act, to make a clear commitment to composting and recycling in New York City and to engage New Yorkers to help make their city a better place for future generations. I want to thank Borough President Brewer, who I see is here today, testifying in support of legislation, as well as my colleagues who have signed on to the and uh, have signed on and the Save Our Compost Coalition, who have fought for this and have held town halls and have been doing great social media and other things to make sure that New Yorkers know about it. And even just in the last few days, we've gotten hundreds of people to sign uh, a, uh, like a letter of support that um, adds their voice, regular New Yorkers, to. Um, to this effort. I see some of my constituents on here, so I want to say hello to them as well. We're going to be hearing my bill, uh, Introduction 1942, which will preserve neighborhood composting and recycling. It will allow for the recycling of organic compostable materials at community drop-off centers and preserve a more far affordable part of the co current composting program that's facing proposed budget cuts, even if we, and as we, may suspend the curbside collection component to this. Specifically, it required the Department of Sanitation to set up three drop-off composting sites in each community district by June 2021, which is the end date. We certainly want them to do it sooner. It requires that sites be set up that are easily accessible, including for people with disabilities and close to public transportation, and crucially requires the department to establish an outreach and education effort so communities are aware of the sites and are informed of the services that they provide. The legislation will ensure that New Yorkers will still have a way to be green and smart about their waste, as well as create more equal access across communities and recycling sites. And I will actually give the department credit here because they are the ones who we went in a conversation with me about this, sparked some ideas around how ways we could do more com community composting. Some of us, I, I live in Stuyvesant Town, have it right downstairs, unfortunately not right now, but we wanna make sure every New Yorker has access to composting and um, recycling. So um, even as we are in a pandemic and face the challenges to recovery uh, and find a fiscal crisis, we wanna make sure we have uh, still upholding our commitment to uh, mitigate the impact of climate change. And if our goal here is, my goal is to get to zero waste, we cannot see the whole city set back at a time to a time before any composting program was set up. So we, I think this is a priority for both myself and uh, the chair, Reynoso, uh, and many others in the borough president as well. So I wanna thank them. Thank you, Department of Sanitation for being here. And again, thank the speaker and Jason Goldman and all the staff here for helping organize this hearing today and make sure that we have a voice around this issue today. So thanks to everybody and I'll uh, look forward to hearing the testimony. Back to you, Chair Cabrera, I think. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, we... Sorry, Chair, I just, before we begin, um, I'd like to go over some procedural items, if that's all right. Yes, please. So I'm Nicole Levine, counsel to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. We'll begin with testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, followed by public testimony. The first three panelists for the public testimony portion will be Eric Goldstein, followed by Carlos Castell Crook, followed by Justin Wood. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And I want to wish uh, Reynoso a, a quick, uh, Chair Reynoso, quick recovery and, uh, and prayers uh, for that as well. Uh, so with that, uh, Nicole, I'll turn it back to, uh, to you uh, for uh, the swearing in. Thank you. Now I will call on members of the administration to testify. Commissioner Garcia, Deputy Commissioner Anderson, and Assistant Commissioner Anderson. I will now deliver the oath to the administration, and I will call on each of you individually to record your answers. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Garcia? I do. Deputy Commissioner Anderson? I do. Assistant Commissioner Anderson? I do. Thank you. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And my best wishes to you, Chair Reynoso. Um, always a pleasure to be able to give testimony before your committee. Um, and good afternoon to the rest of the members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. I am joined today by Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability, and Gregory Anderson, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs. So thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Before addressing these bills specifically, I would like to take a moment to, ref to reflect on the challenging position that we find ourselves in as a city during this time. The COVID-19 pandemic has put immense stress on our city and our communities. The administration has had to make some difficult cuts to the budget to continue core government operations and to devote resources to essential safety, health, shelter, and food security needs. This includes deep cuts to the very programs we are here today to discuss. As I mentioned at our executive budget hearing last month, no one is more frustrated than I am to see these programs be reduced, suspended, or eliminated. But it is a necessary step for our city to take due to our current budget reality. Now, more than ever, we are seeing the importance of supporting communities and giving New Yorkers the tools to continue to sustain and improve their neighborhoods. I believe that the spirit of these bills endeavors to do that, to provide local equitable opportunities for New Yorkers to reduce waste, to fight climate change through daily choices and behaviors, and to bolster a culture of resource reuse and reinvestment locally. Now more than ever, we need to empower individuals and communities to keep our neighbors healthy and safe, to, keep our, to help our city grow and thrive. We look forward to working with council to identify and implement creative approaches to achieve the goals laid out in these bills. I am here today sober about the challenges we face, yet optimistic about our combined passion to overcome them. Despite these challenges, we can work together to achieve our zero waste goals, and we can do so by empowering individuals and communities to make change. For the last five decades, efforts in New York City to conserve resources, reduce waste, and achieve zero waste have often started at the community level. They've been led by residents, teachers, gardeners, nonprofit organizations, block associations, and small businesses. These efforts continue today in neighborhoods across the city, ranging in scale from large to small. At the beginning, recycling of newspaper, cans, and bottles happened because of the hard work and dedication of volunteers collecting materials from their neighbors or working at community drop-off centers. It is only as a result of their work that the city enacted the landmark Local Law 19 of 1989, which created the city's mandatory curbside recycling program. Today, this program is a cornerstone among the city's sustainability programs and we continue to achieve year over year growth in the amount of mixed paper and metal, glass, plastic, and cartons collected. At the Department of Sanitation, our approach is twofold, to support, enrich, and empower community-based efforts to recover resources for beneficial use, while also ensuring that all New Yorkers have access to the tools to contribute to the citywide zero waste effort. At times, these two approaches can create healthy conflict, inspiring thoughtful conversations about the merits of a program's breadth of scale versus depth of engagement. We believe that both approaches are necessary to achieve our goals and that we must take a both and approach, not either or. 
Organic waste is particularly suited for community-based recovery and beneficial use. When composted, food scraps and yard waste become a nutrient-rich soil amendment that can bring health and vibrancy to neighborhoods, from street trees to parks to community gardens. DSNY created the NYC Compost Project in 1993 to rebuild our city soils by providing New Yorkers with the knowledge, skills, and opportunities they need to produce and use compost locally. The seven New York City Compost Project partners located in all five boroughs operate food scrap drop-off sites, process collected material, and distribute finished compost to public greening projects around the city. They also partner with community groups for stewardship projects and provide technical assistance to local gardeners and at-home composters. Since the New York City Compost Project was started in 1993, we have trained more than 800 master composters, worked with thousands of volunteers, and supported more than 225 active community compost sites and gardens. It is thanks to their passionate community composters that we were able to build the momentum that helped us launch and expand the curbside composting program over the last several years. Before COVID-19, DSNY supported the operation of 175 food scrap drop-off sites across all five boroughs. DSNY's support included funding for staffing and site operation, technical assistance, collection services, and local and regional pro processing. Many of these sites were facilitated by our compost project partners or by Grow NYC, and they had a dedicated base of thousands of weekly users. While the funding cuts in fiscal 21 will dramatically reduce the support that we are able to provide to these sites, we hope that independent community support will allow at least some of them to resume as our city begins to reopen. And we will continue to provide training and technical assistance using in-house outreach staff to support our community composters and gardens across the city. We expect to resume financial and operational support for these partners and sites in fiscal year 2022. Another example of DSNY's community-based approach to zero waste is Donate NYC, which helps New Yorkers give goods, find goods, and do good by donating and reusing goods instead of discarding them. New Yorkers can greatly reduce waste, conserve energy and resources, save money, and help provide jobs and human services for New Yorkers in need. Donate NYC also provides vital support for New York City's reuse community, helping nonprofit organizations and local reuse businesses increase and promote their reuse efforts. Thanks to our Donate NYC partners and other providers, New York City has more than 700 clothing and textile drop-off locations located in all 59 community districts across the five boroughs. While some of these locations may be temporarily closed due to the COVID-19, we anticipate that many will resume collection as the city and state continue reopening. For some products and materials, especially those that are inherently hazardous or dangerous, extended producer responsibility policies offer the best approach towards safe and sustainable management. While flawed, the state's electronics recycling law envisions a network of recycling options for New York residents funded by electronics manufacturers and retailers. We continue to have discussions with the state DC regarding the convenience standard and other elements of that law to approve its effectiveness. Producer funded take back programs for paint and pharmaceuticals have also recently been enacted at the state level and we look forward to their implementation in the coming months. Lastly, in this time of financial uncertainty, I would like to highlight two successful programs that operate at no cost to the city. Refashion NYC was conceived in direct response to the city's 2005 waste characterization study, which identified textiles as a component of New York City's residential waste stream with a high potential for reuse. Through Refashion NYC, apartment buildings, nonprofits, and commercial establishments host clothing donation bins that are serviced at no cost to the city by nonprofit charitable organizations who then resell these items to fund their social services. The program was possible because of years of partnership be between DSNY and reuse organizations within the city. Ecycle NYC is a parallel program for apartment buildings to collect and recycle unwanted electronics. Ecycle NYC is supported by electronic producers through the state's electronics recycling law, which requires that producers pay some or all of the costs of such programs. I will now turn to the two bills that we are here to discuss. 
the first bill intro 1942 would require the department to create at least three food and yard waste drop off sites in each of the 59 community districts by June 1st, 2021. Each site would operate a minimum 20 hours per week and would be located in a geographic area that is easily accessible and in close proximity to public transportation. Intro 1943 similarly would require the department to create at least three community recycling centers in each of the 59 community districts by June 1st, 2021. Like the drop-off sites, each recycling center would operate a minimum of 20 hours per week and would be located in a geographic area that is easily accessible and in close proximity to public transportation. The bill envisions that the recycling centers would accept material that can be recycled or reused but are not collected curbside. Such materials may include electronics, textiles, furniture, and other durable goods and certain hazardous waste as practicable. The community recycling centers would be co-located with the food and yard waste drop-off sites in the previous bill. I wanna thank the primary sponsors of these bills, Council Member Powers and Chair Reynoso for introducing them and for convening this important conversation today. I support the intent of both bills to provide local community-based reuse, recycling and composting options, especially for materials that do not already have a curbside collection program. I look forward to hearing from the many advocates and activists and other New Yorkers who will testify today and share their passion and commitment for the community-oriented solutions to zero waste. And I look forward to working with the council to have further discussions on how to achieve our mutual goals. However, given the city's current dire financial situation, I cannot support these bills as introduced. At a time when many, including the council speaker, are calling for even deeper cuts to agency budgets, including ours, it would be impossible for GSNY to comply with a new programmatic mandate of this scale. For intro 1942, I agree that the city should offer a robust network of food scrap drop-off sites in particular neighborhoods that lack curbside composting service. Such a network existed before the COVID crisis with 175 food scrap drop-off sites operating across the city. When the funding for curbside composting and for the New York City Compost Project resumes in July of 2021, I look forward to working with the city council to resume both programs, build participation and achieve success. Intro 1943 would create an entirely new network of community recycling centers. While I am certainly concerned about the cost of such an initiative, I also have serious concerns about the feasibility of siting and the regulatory requirements that would apply. I look forward to hearing more from the sponsors and from others who have joined today to better understand the intent and scope of this legislation. As we look beyond the COVID-19 crisis, I want to reassure the members of this committee and all New Yorkers who are watching at home that we remain committed to our zero waste goals. While the budget realities have caused great and unfortunate setbacks, they also offer us an opportunity to reflect, to plan, and as we recover, to implement programs even better and more innovative than those that were cut or suspended. I look forward to ongoing conversations with the city council and the passionate advocates and stakeholders who care deeply about these issues in the coming weeks and months. Thank you for your time and I am happy to answer any questions. Before we begin the questions, we had some trouble capturing your answers to the oath on Zoom. So I'm going to re-administer that for all three of you. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, I please do. speak loudly. I <laughs> Commissioner do. Garcia? Deputy Commissioner Anderson? I do. I do. Can you hear me? Thank you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Assistant Commissioner Anderson? I do. Thank you. I'll turn it back to the chair now. Thank you. Finally got unmuted. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner, uh, for your testimony. And at this time, I know I have some questions, but I want to let my uh, colleagues, uh, and, and especially the sponsor of the bill, uh, Powers, 
uh, begin with their questions. And I know that Nicole has some instructions. Okay. Um, so after council member powers, I will call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Please keep your questions to five minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. Throughout the question and answer period, we will continue to call on council members to respond. Um, Chair, you're beginning with council member powers. So council member powers. Great, thank you. Thank you for the testimony and thanks for uh, all you're doing right now. I know you're a lot on your plate, uh, no pun intended right now. <laughs> when it comes to uh, what's happening in the city. So thanks for all you're doing. Um, I, I hear your comments related to, uh, I guess, both bills, particularly 1942. Is the concern right now from the administration standpoint, the cost of running it, it or is it alternately, or maybe it's both? Is it the cost of running it and the fiscal situation of the city, or is it logistical concerns and rules and regulations that pertain to putting the program together? Certainly. So for the for the food scrap drop off sites, the concern is primarily financial for the recycling centers, depending on what products or materials, uh, there could be some regulatory challenges. But the other just logistical challenge is finding locations uh, in the city in terms of siting that many. But I mean, the overall thing right now is like, unless we get some funding from the federal government, there are likely to be more cuts rather than expansion of any programs. And what is the cost for um, 19, intro 1942 estimate? What would be the cost to put that in place? So for the food scrap drop off yeah, one, sure. it's you know, our, uh, the 175 uh, sites that we run now, I believe it costs us about $3 million a year. Got it, which is, I mean, I am as as wide eyed as anybody else when it comes to cuts, but the three million is, uh, you know, for us, I think a, a, a very small fraction of the entire uh, puzzle here. And then also, you know, clearly keeps some of our goals in place. But if we were to receive federal aid or other aid through borrowing or something else, is it is it is it fair to say the administration's position on that might change if the fiscal situation change for the city? Oh, I think. Definitely, particularly for like the food scrap drop off program or the compost project and some of those. If the if we end up with enough money, uh, you know, I think the conversation is very, very different. Um, but if we don't, and unfortunately, I don't think they're likely to pass anything federally before the end of this month when we need to adopt a budget. Uh, you know, it's it's just a really challenging financial time. Um, so. I, I, I go up and down on where I think the Senate will land uh, on whether or not they'll be willing to provide us with the type of resources the, and the amount of resources we would really need to keep moving this forward. But you're right, it, it, normally in a normal year, uh, that budget would be a rounding error. Um, the Office of Management and Budget is pushing everyone to go find every rounding error that we possibly can. Um, because of their concern about the revenue stream. I got it. Uh, well, we hope if there is revenue, I mean, we, we, will, we will fight, I know myself and the chair to get it restored anyway in this budget, but I under, even understanding the fiscal situation, if there is more funding, I think we'll certainly be looking to partner with you to find ways to bring this back. Um, the, um, the budget proposed, you know, the cuts to the curbside organics and community composting for one year during fiscal 2021. Can you just tell us the cost of per ton of disposing organics versus refuse? Uh, so the cost is about, it's about a $4 difference per ton uh, between organics and um, refuse. However, the way the refuse contract works is that uh, because there are fixed costs in it, um, you don't get to fully net out the cost of refuse disposal. Okay, and so would there be near-term savings achieved at the city to the city if organic material is diverted by to the is, is diverted from our refuse stream? No. No. Okay. That's why it's a savings. If it actually saved me money, I probably would have gotten to keep it. Right. No, I, I believe that's true. 
what is the amount of um, organic tonnage that was collected for fiscal year 2019 and prior to COVID in 2020? What is the amount of organic tonnage that was collected curbside? Um, and then I'm how collected drop at the drop off sites. Sure, I'm gonna. I see if Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson can answer that because I don't have the historic numbers in front of me. Sure. Um, for the drop off sites specifically, um, there were about three thousand tons. Uh, collected. Um, for the curbside program, it was about 50,000 uh, tons. I think you had asked both questions. What was the first answer? Sorry. The first about 3,000. 3,000. Okay. And if currently, if people want to divert their organics from landfill, what are their options? So their, their options really are what they can do either in their homes or their backyards uh, at this point in time. Okay. And our community garden composting program still out to operate? Uh, they have not been yet in terms of the green, if they are on green thumb property, I don't believe that the Parks Department has reopened those at this point in time. Um, for anyone who is planning to reopen, we have provided guidance to people about, and that is on our website, uh, about how to do it safely. Um, but I, I believe that many of the sites are on Parks property and Parks has not yet permitted reopening of those. I, those I will be able to reopen. And we think there are some community gardens and such that rely on primarily volunteers and can actually compost on their site who will reopen and do that. Uh, but we just haven't quite gotten into that phase yet. And has Parks given you any sort of guidance on when they'll be able to accept drop-offs again? Um, no, I think that we're waiting a little bit until at least phase two. Phase two, okay. Um, and what, is, what response have you received from community compost program regarding the budget cuts? I think as you would expect, I think they're very, very disappointed. I've heard from many of them, uh, and, I, and I mean, I follow the petitions. I know how people feel. I mean, uh, the reason we've been successful at all in moving this is their real passion and commitment to this program. Uh, so I think there's, there's sort of an overarching um, sad time expired. Okay. Okay, that's my time. Um, I just want to ask maybe one or two more questions, if that's okay, just from some of the ones we have here. Um, I talked about community gardens. Advocates have suggested to us that community gardens have received grants that enable them to process compost. Would DSNY factor that in if this is passed? So, you mean private philanthropic grants? Yeah, I believe so. So if they're, if they're able to raise money on their own for some of the processing or other issues that would come from that, you know, we will provide technical support, we'll provide outreach. Those are sort of what we have still in our toolkit at this point in time. Okay, uh, just a couple more and then I'll hand it back over. Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. Um, what can be done to make it easier to process collected organics locally rather than, as I understand, we transport them upstate, right? So rather than transporting them upstate, what can we do to make it easier to process collected organics locally? Well, I mean, I think one of the things is that the biggest challenge we have about processing it locally is finding a site to do it on. Um, that, is the, that has been the ongoing issue. It, it is pretty intensive in terms of uh, the amount of land use that you need. Um, you know, we have also tried to partner with the Department of Environmental Protection so that we can turn it into a biogas the food scraps, but for doing, uh, you know, more normal uh, compost sites that you may have seen, you need you need space. And um, many of the New York City compost project folks are under a lot of pressure for the sites that they're on even now, even without budget cuts. Yeah. Okay. And um, if we pass this bill or we we came to an agreement and we had funding for it. Would you be open to hearing community input on the compost sites that were chosen uh, if we were doing three per site? And how do you imagine that process works? All right, no, I'd, we'd certainly be open to, to working with all of the stakeholders in this. We usually do try and uh, have those ongoing conversations. We have a lot of interactions with many of the people who are on this panel all the time uh, about where those locations are, but you know, Definitely near public transportation has been very successful in certain areas, um, but sometimes we get it wrong and we have to move it. You know, it doesn't, the, the uptake isn't there. And then we've changed locations uh, to see if we could get better participation at a different location. Uh, so we, we are really willing to be flexible. Is there a formal process you envision or is it uh, 
ongoing conversation, dialogue, or is there a process by which folks would be able to nominate or discuss sites that are in their community? Uh, so oftentimes it is, they will nominate sites, but then it, it's, we go through a process in terms of whether or not that makes sense, uh, given can they support the site? Um, do we have the right resources to support the site? Okay, I'm gonna stop there just as respect for everybody else who's uh, waiting to ask questions. I may have a few more later, but I'll, uh, I'll have to run to a budget meeting shortly. But uh, thank you to Chair Cabrera for your for giving me the time. And thanks to, to Commissioner. And, and thanks. To, I just want to say thank you to all the folks who are working with us on this. I, I am encouraged to hear that if there is some funding, you're open to doing something here. I think we should find the funding this year. Like $3 million is just so minimal. But, um, but understand that we have to be a little, uh, uh, this is a very difficult year. But um, we'll, we'll continue to talk about ways if, if funding becomes available to do that. So thank, thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Cohen, followed by Councilmember Chin. Councilmember Cohen? Starting time. Uh, thank you very much. It's good to see you, Commissioner. Nice to see you. Uh, I know we've talked about, uh, you know, really how heartbroken we are about the situation in terms of composting. Um, you know, I, I'm concerned about what you think uh, sort of the long-term impact on and getting people to participate because, you, know, you know, you and I, you came up to my district, we kicked off uh, curbside collections in the district together. Um, but getting people, like it's a culture change and a way of thinking that this is really going to set us back. I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what you think uh, the impact will be uh, in terms of, you know, if, you know, if and when we get back to, to being able to do this, uh, how much, you know, we're going to lose in terms of people's participation. So, I mean, there, I'm very cognizant of the experience we had um, after 9-11 when recycling was canceled and came back and then came back slightly differently, um, that we will lose ground during this particular year. Um, and I know that that means that they, we are going to have to think really strategically around how we plan for bringing it back uh, to make sure that we are re-engaging with everyone in the community. Um, but we also need to work together about like what is our overall path towards getting to a mandatory program uh, and making it so that you know we are invested both in making sure that people understand what to do, but also that they are doing it. Can you t talk a, a little bit about, um, I mean, you probably did and I missed it, I apologize, uh, where, we all, where, where we were at in terms of participation, uh, either uh, both curbside and do we know how many people were using the drop-off sites? So um, we don't have accounts of that. The probably the best is what uh, Deputy Commissioner Anderson said, which was about 3,000 tons in the drop-off sites and about 50,000 tons in the curbside program. But, I mean, that doesn't sound, you know, relative to how much trash you move, it doesn't sound like that much. It is still a small percentage. I mean, obviously, it's not available to everyone. Um, and it was voluntary. And so, you know, we were, we did a lot of different uh, outreach, including some campaign style outreach things, door-to-door uh, -door education. But still, it, it has been one of the, the challenges with the program is getting people to participate. So we have some folks who are very, very dedicated and some folks who were less dedicated. Uh, I'm just gonna give, uh, I think I've mentioned this to you and it, it's, uh, it's in housing and buildings, but I have a good bill that would uh, require new, new, new construction to build infrastructure in the building for organics collection. I hope that uh, after COVID we get to hear that bill. I would uh, love your thoughts on it. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Chin. Council Member Chin. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your testimony. I have a couple of questions. Uh, out of the 175 sites that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, do they include all the farmers market site in yes. the city? Yeah. Um, Okay, that's unfortunate because uh, that's where a lot of my constituents, you know, I see them on the weekend dropping things off, dropping their food scrap, and it's like a ritual 
and we definitely need to find a way to continue that. Um, the other one thing is that, have you looked at Governor's Island? Uh, because Earth Matter is out there. And when we tour Governor's Island, like during the summer, uh, I mean, they have a really big composting program out there. Uh -huh. They compost all the food scrap uh, uh -huh. on Governor's Island itself. And right now they still got a lot of land. I mean, it hasn't been developed yet. And so that might be an opportunity to really utilize those space uh, to expand a uh, composting program. I mean, you could take the food scrap, like tuck boats or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's some place that I think we really need to look at, uh, especially in the short term. And my third point is on um, the business improvement district throughout the city. Um, I think they are an important resource that can help us with community uh, drop-off site uh, for composting. Um, because, you know, they're part of the community. They work with small businesses, but they also work with residential property owner. And they have the, the people, uh, the staff that can manage some of the drop-off site. So I think we should really uh, reach out to some of them, especially the one that uh, represent a large uh, residential area and see if they could be a partner uh, in this time when, you know, when we don't have the budget, uh, but they might be a good resource to help us. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. I mean, I think that those are two really interesting points uh, about using Governor's Island. It might take us a little time to figure out how to get things to Governor's Island. I don't think we could use tugboats. Um, but <laughs> Well, you should talk to Governor's Island. I mean, I, I can help you. Um, you know, they have more ferries and, uh, hey, and, um, you know, you could borrow the tugboat from the South Street Seaport Museum. <laughs> There's ways to get it there. Uh, but it, it just is a, a resource. I mean, they got a lot of space and they're already doing composting. So yes. I, I think it's just great, you know, that we can use them to help us. And what about the business improvement district? So the business improvement district, like, let me think about how to, uh, we will reach out to them um, about how that might be something that could be useful. I, I need to think about it a little bit about how uh, they would fit in. But I, I think that you're right. They are always a resource to us um, in anything that we do, whether or not it's on um, uh, waste or cleaning. Uh, they've always been central to to how we think about ensuring those uh, commercial corridors stay um, in good shape. Yeah, I, I'll be happy to reach out to the one in my district and also with Governor's Island. Um, so let me know okay, if, you, if you need help with that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Chair Cabrera, seeing no more council member questions, should we move to public testimony? Yes, please. Thank you. And we want to also recognize that we were joined by Council Member Brannon. Thank you, Commissioner. I uh, appreciate your testimony. I know these Thank are you. difficult times. And uh, hopefully, uh, we will get help from the federal government. If we don't, these are going to be very difficult days. Very difficult. Uh, on anything we have ever seen. So it is my hope that uh, we, we do get that help. And so with that, uh, this wraps up the uh, administration's testimony. I will turn it over to Nicole, who will go over the procedure for public testimony. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after three panelists have completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. We'll be starting with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Following her testimony, the next panel will be Eric Goldstein, followed by Carlos Castell Croak, followed by Justin Wood. Manhattan Borough President. 
Thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I certainly want to thank Interim Chair Cabrera, um, certainly Council Member Powers, and I hope Council Member Reynoso feels better. I am a co-sponsor of both Intro 1942 and Intro 1943, and I fully support establishing drop-off centers for New Yorkers to recycle organic and inorganic materials in the 59 community districts. I don't need to tell you that from my perspective, these centers are crucial to ensure that the city continues toward zero waste by 2030. These centers and every community will expand recycling in an equitable way, uh, opportunity to drop off food scraps, e-waste and textiles into districts that have not yet been served by site organics. I also ask the members of the committee to consider the following recommendations as you work on the passage of the, both bills. In the districts, home to public housing often exists and at least one of the three required community recycling centers we think should be cited either within a development or a location that is accessible to the NYCHA residents. The NYCHA location would also accept food straps, I hope. When determining where to establish drop-offs, sanitation needs to work with NYCHA's really wonderful sustainability team and with the residents under consideration before decisions are, are made. And once a location of certain NYCHA is selected, I hope that everyone would work on education and outreach. Second, the community centers can also serve as collection sites for disposing pharmaceutical waste. We, as you know, we have a very active Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board known as SWAB. And that particular committee analyzed the reach of state legislation, which allows retail pharmacies to register as pharmaceutical waste collectors and install collection boxes to take back drugs and other unused controlled substances. You know, that's a problem if you keep them around. Swab found that almost no pharmacy in Manhattan had installed collection boxes, nor were the pharmacies on site aware of their store's ability to do so. Swab members could only confirm one pharmacy in New York Square that had a box. So with the shortage of collection opportunities outside of annual national prescription drug take back days, which we all participated in, and periodic safe disposal events, this committee should work with the sanitation department and the Department of Health on the state level to consider including pharmaceutical waste as part of these centers. Finally, I want to reiterate, as you know, the importance of education and outreach. That's what's always needed. New Yorkers need to know about the centers in order to participate. And as this wonderful city council continues to work out the details of the FY21 budget, I know the challenges, I really urge that there be sufficient funding for alerting the public about community recycling centers and encourage recycling in general. Thank you for the support and support of recycling expansion, organic collection throughout the city of New York. And I hope we can pass into 1942 and into 1943. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Power. Thank you, thank you, Burr President. Nice to see you. Uh, thank you as always for everything you do in, uh, in my district in Borough. You, you talked a little bit of education. First of all, I, I like the suggestion around around public housing, and I think it's a great one. One we'll look at. So I appreciate that. And um, also, like even where I live in Stuyvesant Town, like having an organized neighborhood where you can really, you know, kind of coordinate is extremely helpful to us. But for people that live outside of big complexes and where it, it seems so, people don't know what even composting is. And some some people, only, I think in my district, how easy it is, how simple it is. And then also coastal, some logistical hurdles to getting um, people what they need to be able to do it. Do you have any thoughts or recommendations on how we together educate constituents in, let's say, Manhattan or anywhere else about, uh, about how to do it and also how to ease people um, into it and, and make it easier for people to be able to do it? I have blocks and neighborhoods in my district where it seems like people, we could should look to ship. I'm sure there is a map of usage somewhere, but where it seems like there's just a, a tremendous opportunity to increase participation. I hate to keep bringing up the schools, but it's like, that's how we started recycling was the kids started doing it. And then they asked their parents why they weren't. 
So as you know, it has not been a great success at the schools. And we started out on the Upper West Side, eight parents, eight schools, I remember it well, and then it spread citywide, but has not gone really well. So I think to answer your question, again, this is a tremendous loss if we don't continue it. But I think we have to focus on the schools and make sure they're doing it and the kids participate. We had at some point, you know, volunteer teacher, volunteer one, uh, guidance counselor, somebody. Uh, we tried to get them some extra funding. That didn't work out. Working with the kitchen staff and then working with the kids to have some kind of competition. You know, you got to work on your lunch. You got to make sure that it goes into the right bin, et cetera. And I do think that's the way to start, to be honest with you is to get and, the school to do it right. They're not doing it right now. And is the hardest hurdle for the schools, I imagine, is just getting the students to be able to sort out and and the staff to be able to... Because uh, yeah, as soon as you compromise a bin, as you know, right. then the end result is not good and the land use end result company is not gonna take the scraps. So that's been our problem without getting into so many specifics. I think uh, Bridget knows this only too well. And that's after a lot of work. I mean, there was work put into this, um, but it just takes more. And, it, you know, so I don't know how else to say it. I think, I know my block does it, you know, so it's very haphazard as to which block or which development. Obviously, NYCHA would make a huge difference. I only talk about the rats. If you get rid of organics in a positive way, then you're not going to have rats. And that's where I wish we could have more conversation because that's a good uh education a good public relations don't talk about organics talk about rats and that's where you get people's attention uh, after the answer to your question schools and rats yeah yeah all right gotcha, gotcha. okay thank you thanks for the testimony next we'll hear from council member lander thank you very much chair cabrera it's good to be with you and i'm going to ask this question of the next panel as well but i would love the borough president's take on it um for a president, you know, obviously I represent a district like the one you used to represent in the council with a lot of people so eager to participate in the organics program. And so like you, we've taken a kind of, you know, coalition of the willing approach. Let's get people where they're excited and go with the kind of voluntary energy approach. And on the one hand, I've loved that, you know, my, my block, a lot of my neighbors really like doing it. They're so sad about the program being lost. But I wonder a little now that we're looking at the fact that we've built a program that doesn't actually save us money because it's not at the full scale that we need for the city. Do you think, I mean, we got to do what we can in this year's budget to preserve and save pieces of this program. But as we're looking longer term, do you think we need to consider options that, um, that are a little less coalition of the willing and a little more like it becomes mandatory, it's the law of the city or... I don't know, what are we gonna to do to build a program that gets out beyond you know, a, a few pockets where people love doing it because the only way to get to zero waste is something with a fuller adoption. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. I'll tell you also, if you get to a certain point and I, you know, I'm not allowed to ask questions but that would have been a question for the city because there is a demarcation where it ends up, we save money and not cost. And so what is that, uh, milestone? What is that metric? So that would be another question that I'd love to get answered. I think IBO uh, has a number. I don't know what the city's number is. So, uh, and then of course we have the whole issue, which is also controversial about the ways in which going down the sink is another opportunity, which I know DEP doesn't often like. So I think all of this has to be considered because we cannot have uh, these heavy loads uh, and we can't and we need it for composting. I mean, it, there's just so many ways that organics needs to not be in the landfill for cost reasons and for rats, which is always my issue, and just for the composting. So it, it really needs attention. And, and as you know, the worst thing to do is to stop the program because then people, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So I'm very concerned about it. And, and I wish that we could, hopefully at least this interim measure could be instituted, but it needs to have a whole year of thought process from commercial to schools. The schools are a challenge. I mean, we've been trying for eight years. And so they need a real heavy uh, support mechanism of some kind too. Because that's 1.1 lunch plus breakfast. 
That's a lot of organic. Thank you. Do any other council members have questions for the Manhattan Borough President? Seeing none, next we'll hear from uh, Eric Goldstein, followed by Carlos Castell Crook, followed by Justin Wood. Eric? Starting time. Thank you, Council Member Cabrera, Powers, Lander, Borough President Brewer, and best wishes to Chairman Reynoso. Uh, my name is Eric Goldstein, and I'm the New York City Environment Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. One of the often overlooked facts about environmental history in New York City is that going back to the beginnings of the modern environmental movement, it's frequently been the city council, not the mayor's office, that's instigated positive environmental policy changes for all city residents. Uh, that's been the case throughout the decades, and it was illustrated again last year when under the leadership of Speaker Johnson, the council passed landmark climate change legislation. Indeed, on the composting issue, uh, the city council wisely began steering the city in the right direction uh, almost a decade ago when in 2013 it passed local law 77, creating what became the largest voluntary residential organics collection curbside program. And that same year it passed local law 146, establishing a smart program for separating and collecting organics from restaurants and other food services establishments. Even back then, the council understood that composting organics was critical to ending the city's global warming emissions and recycling trash into useful compost. The de Blasio administration uh, has said the right things, but somehow the administration has lost its way on this issue. It's already eliminated the curbside organics pilot program, and it's done so despite having the commitment in its 2015 one NYC sustainability plan to expand it to serve all New Yorkers. City Hall apparently views organics collection as a frivolous operation like the after-school clarinet program rather than the essential sanitation service it is. This is short-sighted and ill-advised. It'll boost the city's contribution to uh, emissions from landfills. It'll pull the rug out from under Grove, New York City and the Lower East Side Ecology Center, big reuse, earth matters, and local botanic gardens across the city. They've been operating successful programs for composting on a shoestring budget for many years and it'll leave tens of thousands of New Yorkers without a way to sustain Time expired. of their organics. Uh, two last points. The mayor's proposal provides the perfect opportunity for the council to act. The most important step is to restore $7 million in funding to preserve community composting. This is a drop in the bucket compared to the 107 million that's been cut from the DSNY budget. And as the council explores ways of cutting back on the New York City Police Department budget, in part to enhance needed social programs, a move we support, we suggest that a tiny portion of those reallocated funds be set aside to support the $7 million request. Finally, we strongly support the two very sensible pieces of legislation before the committee. Uh, we detail the reasons for doing that in our written testimony. Um, and we believe that Commissioner Garcia cares about these issues but we urge you to find funds in the existing budget to at least keep this program alive and to work seriously with the project sponsors to advance these bills. In regard to uh, Council Member Lander's question, ultimately the council should enact a new law requiring the mandatory separation of discarded organics and the curbside collection of these materials from every city household. That's the only way we'll make this program be able to stand on its two feet and actually make funds uh, for the city taxpayers. Finally, we're grateful to the council staff, especially Nicole Labine, Asher Friedman, Abigail Bressler, and Laura Popa for focusing on this important issue when the issues of the coronavirus and systemic racism have justifiably occupied so much public attention. We thank everyone on the council staff for making this an important issue and for uh, seeking to address it today. Thank you. As a reminder to council members, we'll be asking for questions after each three panelists. So next we'll hear from Carlos Castell Crook, followed by Justin Wood, followed by Toke Michelle Oyewole. Starting time. Carlos? Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Crook, and I am a representative from the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City. 
and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I would like to thank Chair Reynoso, Chair Cabrera, and Councilmember Powers for the opportunity to testify today. In 2015, Mayor de Blasio made a pledge that excited environmentalists and citizens alike. This pledge was to reduce the waste we send to landfills by 90% by the year 2030. Yet here we are, five years later, having made little progress toward the zero waste goal. Now due to COVID-19 and the recession, the mayor has suspended curbside collection of organic waste and is proposing to cut funding for community composting. While these cuts are upsetting, uh, upsetting to see, we understand that the financial strain on our city must be addressed. However, we would like to use these cuts as an opportunity to reevaluate, revamp, and expand our waste diversion program so that we come out of this crisis for to achieve zero waste by the original 2030 deadline. Intros 1942 and 1943 would be a crucial step in the journey to our zero waste goal. By establishing three community drop-off sites per community district, New York City will be able to continue its composting and recycling efforts even as curbside collection is suspended. Bringing these recycling opportunities to every community district is a crucial step towards a more equitable waste diversion program. And we are pleased that these bills would provide opportunities to recycle materials such as textiles and electronic waste in addition to organic waste. It is also crucial that we maintain the recycling culture we have already established. As we saw when the metal glass and plastic recycling program was suspended during the post 9-11 recession, when recycling programs are cut, participation rates struggle to recover when the programs are reinstated. Therefore, we are also asking that the council restore $7 million in the fiscal 20 year budget for existing community compost collection sites. But this, would be an, this would not only provide an outlet for New Yorkers to continue to recycle their organic waste, but also maintain dedicated composting personnel at Grow NYC, Big Reuse, the Lower East Side Recology Center, and other I'm groups expired. that have operated these essential community based programs for years. Our goal of zero waste landfills by 2030 is an achievable one, but we, will we must make decisions and establish programs that work towards it, not cut the programs necessary for us to make progress. We urge the council to pass intro 1942, intro 1943, and reinstate the $7 million for community composting and budget to help New Yorkers continue to recycle their organic waste. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Justin Wood, followed by Tok Oyewole, followed by Dior Sin Hilaire. Starting time. Justin? Hello and good afternoon. My name is Justin Wood. I'm the Director of Organizing and Research at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest and a member of the Save Our Compost Coalition. I want to thank Council Members uh, Powers, Chair Reynoso, and Co-Chair Cabrera for moving so swiftly to introduce and have a hearing on these bills after learning that funding for both curbside and community drop-off collections of organic waste and textiles were suspended due to budget cuts imposed by the mayor. We also want to specifically thank Speaker Corey Johnson for scheduling this important hearing amidst an ongoing crisis of policing, public health and mass unemployment in the city, and thank the members of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus for an announcing a plan to reduce the NYPD budget by $1 billion, an urgent step needed to reform our massive police department and to mitigate the devastating cuts to other vital services in the mayor's proposed budget, including DSNY recycling, organics, and community education programs, as we've been hearing about today. NILPI strongly supports the principles of the CORE Act and urge the council to pass it immediately after making any amendments necessary based on the testimony we've heard today. In particular, these bills assurance that all communities will host at least three accessible and equitably cited recycling drop-off sites will help to ensure that communities historically excluded from recycling and compost programs can fully participate in and learn about the benefits of waste reduction convenient to home. However, uh, like some of the other panelists, our most urgent request is that the council use the budget negotiating process to insist on restoring the very modest $7 million in funding needed for community drop-off sites and community education programs run by DSNY and its nonprofit partners to immediately resume operations. While the CORE Act will ensure that the city gives all New Yorkers the option to recycle and compost, it may take up to a year to implement even if passed quickly. By acting immediately- I'm expired. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we also support strongly um, the restoration of $7 million uh, in the budget so we can get this up and running quickly. 
and we also hope to work with the council on a citywide mandatory organics program that's uh, really what we need, as, as several council members mentioned, to create good green jobs and move the needle on climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. If council members have questions for the panel that just spoke, please use the hand raise Zoom function now. We'll begin with Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, Nicole. Great job uh, today. And uh, I want to thank the panelists. I, I want to follow up and appreciate your testimony. Uh, very insightful. Uh, with um, Matt and Borough President Gail Brewer's uh, comment, uh, do, you, do you, any of you happen to know uh, regarding her question and the economy, really, if I understood the question right, the economy of scales when it comes to organic, at what point uh, do we see uh, more of a gain than a loss compu uh, uh, in comparison to other types of weights? Yes, uh, uh, Council Member Cabrera, let me quickly uh, see if I can answer that question. There are two costs to disposing of waste. One is the costs of getting rid of the waste or the trash at the end of the line. That's the tipping fee. There, it costs less to dispose of food waste and yard waste because they can be turned into valuable commodities, compost. And so if you're taking your food waste or yard waste to a, a composting facility or an anaerobic digestion facility, you will pay less per ton to dump that trash than you would if you have to send the waste to a distant landfill or incinerator where the costs could be up to $130 a ton and those costs have been going up for the city for years. So. In order to make composting and organics collection save tens of millions of dollars for taxpayer residents, we just have to make sure that the costs of collecting that trash are equivalent to the costs of collecting ordinary waste today. And there should be no reason why it isn't because it's still the same amount of trash. But you need to have full trucks of organics in the same way that you have now full trucks of regular trash. That can only be done the experience in Seattle, San Francisco, and Portland show by having a mandatory composting program. So you have the same amount of waste that you're collecting, but you're collecting it in an organics truck, in a recycling truck, and then in a, in a truck that collects whatever is left over. And by rescheduling um, and revamping your collection uh, system, uh, according to each neighborhood's needs, uh, you are able to, re to get those uh, collection costs to be equivalent, whether it's the existing program or organics, and you're saving money uh, in the disposal costs at the end of the line. So as council member Lander said, once we uh, get the council to enact a mandatory composting program, a uh, mandatory composting organics collection program, and give the city time to work out the kinks, to get the system right, to figure out what went right and what went wrong with the voluntary pilot project, the city taxpayers can be saving tens of millions of dollars a year by sending all of our food waste and yard waste to composting operations. It also creates in-city jobs. It's more equitable from an environmental justice perspective. Uh, in, and of course, it will put a big dent in climate change because landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions in the United States. So if, if, if the city is looking at these issues from a long-term perspective, that's where we need to be heading. So Eric, help me here, and I, I, I don't wanna be long, but you, you literally put all the green checks in every single item, uh, which, which matters at the end of the day. So you, you're giving a great value for us to go this way. The only one that she said, and I heard the commissioner, you were there, I was watching you, uh, was that if it made economic sense, then we will go, we will, she will be on board where got it. Well, is there something that, uh, because obviously because of the budget constraints right now, uh, but is there something that is not translating here in terms of what you're saying? And I, I'm sure you have plenty of conversation. Let, let me try one more time. The existing voluntary program has, as uh, Councilmember Lander said, the participants of the willing. 
And right. but what that means is the city has been sending around the sanitation department an extra truck to collect food waste and yard waste. Since it's been voluntary, some people have been participating, some not. As a result, those trucks go back empty or half oh, empty really? or a third empty. That's inefficient and therefore it costs more. If you have a mandatory program, folks will be putting out their food waste uh, in much larger quantities. You'll be able to reroute your trucks and reschedule your systems for collection and you'll be having food trucks, food waste trucks that are full, just like regular trash trucks. And right. in that case, the labor costs will be equivalent because it's the same amount of waste, but you'll be saving money on every ton that you send to a composting facility rather than to an expensive out-of-state landfill. So Eric, I get all that. I get all that. My big question is, why not pull the trigger here? Uh, since what you're saying makes more sense, especially if you have the economy of scales taking place there, right? So that's, I, I, and I don't understand why the pushback from the administration, if at the end of the day, it's gonna save us more money. And at the same time, we have, uh, we are answering the economic, you know, constraints that we have right now, that at the end of the day, it's gonna save us money, you know. Uh, uh, well, I, the last thing I'll say is the administration agrees with that philosophically. Commissioner Garcia has been a big supporter of mandatory organics collection and the mayor in his 2015 uh, sustainability report said, we're gonna do this and we're gonna have collections for all New Yorkers by the end of 2018. So philosophically they're there. As we know right now, it's in the middle of two separate significant crises and the budget people in City Hall are just looking at the next six months. And that may be the right thing for them to do, but for the city council, we expect our representatives to take a longer term view of what's best for all of the people in this city over the years to come. And there's no doubt that restoration of this tiny $7 million to keep these programs that have been successfully operating on a shoestring alive, and then to plan in the fall for passage of a mandatory organics program that would phase in after you analyze what went right and what went wrong, you come up with a plan for how to do it, how to reschedule your collections and how to do it efficiently and working with the unions that would support this. Uh, and that ought to be done uh, by the council in the fall. Hopefully the administration would support that uh, because number one, in that first year when we're facing our biggest budget crisis, there won't be any consequences. You're really asking the sanitation department to study what went right and what went wrong with their pilot project, and then to begin uh, developing an implementation plan that would take place in the out years. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you have 110% support, and we'll continue uh, here in the council and another committee. You have a true champion, the chair, and council member powers, and all the committee, uh, committee members, we're, we're standing with you 100%. Uh, and let's get this to the finish line. It just makes sense all around. I just wanted you to say and put it on the record. Uh, Thank you so much. Here. Thank you and so much, Council Member Cabrera. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Uh, I want to recognize we'll be also joined by Council Members Heim Dodge and Constantinidi. Uh, and with that, I turn it back to Nicole for any other Council Members who may have questions. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Lander. Starting time. Thanks very much. Uh, and I joined a little, a uh, little late, so maybe this got asked of the commissioner. But I think with this panel, it's a good place to ask too. I just want to make sure we, uh, for the record, draw out the environmental justice issues here, uh, and really understand the ways in which failing to stand up a more comprehensive organics program leads to additional truck traffic in low-income communities of color with all the attendant uh, asthma and health risks that go along with that and what we could imagine if we get to the other side of this. Um, so I wonder whether um, one of the panelists could, could speak to that. Um, I think Eric touched on all these things and thank you, Council Member Lander and Co-Chair Cabrera for your questions. Um, I think one thing just to, to stress is that uh, organics recycling in particular, um, 
leads to a lot more jobs cumulatively. All the studies show this than exporting waste to landfills and incinerators. Um, and it can lead to a lot more in city and near city jobs. Um, and these can be good, high quality, green jobs, union jobs, living wage jobs. Um, so it, it's a chance both to reduce the diesel truck emissions needed and, and train emissions and, and um, pollution, PM 2.5 and all these things that we now know are, are linked to COVID uh, and so many other diseases, a chance to reduce those emissions, particularly in communities that have borne the brunt of uh, living near uh, transfer stations geared towards exporting waste. Um, and then it's also a chance to create a lot of uh, good in-city jobs and try to target those jobs um, and that infrastructure development to communities that are also being hit the hardest by mass unemployment. And I know other panelists will have a lot to say on this. Um, just one other note, I mean, at the beginning of this crisis, there was some new data coming out of cities like Seattle showing that on the economies of scale question, they had indeed, by getting such widespread compost and organics recycling, reduced their cost um, to the point that it was lower than or, or at most equivalent to um, landfill. So these costs really can be brought down while creating a lot more jobs and reducing both local emissions and carbon emissions. Uh, that's great. Thank you. I was going to ask about what cities had seen reductions, but I think between that and some of what Eric said in his answer to Chair Cabrera earlier, uh, that was really helpful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no more council member questions, we'll move on to the next panel. We'll hear first from Toke Michelle Oyewoye, Dior Saint, and then followed by Dior Saint Hilaire and Justin Green. Toke. Starting time. Hello, thank you to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management for the opportunity to speak today and uh, speedy recovery to Chair Reynoso. Um, my name is Dr. Tok Michelle Oyewole and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low-income neighborhoods and communities of color in their fight for environmental justice. For decades, NIJA has led efforts for comprehensive policy reforms to address the disproportionate burden of New York's solid waste system on a handful of environmental justice communities. To handle ne nearly 35,000 tons of garbage generated each day in New York City, waste trucks needlessly drive uh, thousands of miles per night through multiple boroughs in New York City, polluting our air with diesel fuel, clogging our streets, and diminishing our quality of life. The impacts are greatest in those few low income and communities of color where truck dependent transfer stations are clustered, causing higher proportions of health consequences such as asthma, heart disease, and cancer. Today, we're testifying to urge the city to not sidetrack its climate justice and zero waste goals by eliminating opportunities for recycling, organics, and other waste streams. In the short term, we urge the city to immediately restore food scrap drop off sites by funding them at the relatively small amount of $7 million. Additionally, passing the CORE Act would increase access to food scrap and textile recycling for all New Yorkers, including in the outer boroughs and NYCHA residences. Uh, local scale organics processing can divert waste from being trucked to transfer stations clustered in the environmental justice communities in New York City. Completely eliminating all forms of organics collection means that the majority of this waste will go to the inter intermediary local transfer stations, then to landfills and incinerators in EJ communities outside of the city. A better solution would be to process this organic waste locally, which in the long run could reduce costs from truck transport and tipping into facilities. This requires the city to make a commitment to increasing its local organics processing capacity in the very near term. Some of the drop-off sites- I'm select expired. Okay, just a few quick points. Um, some of the drop-off sites selected um, should be coupled with processing capacity to ensure that we're streamlining processing organic waste at a local level. Um, we wanna ensure that the collection programs do not replicate uh, harms in, in EJ communities by ensuring we're optimizing truck routes, um, using um, collection uh, with zero and low emission vehicles when possible, um, cutting just 5% of the NYPD's uh, $516 million overtime budget would provide around four times the amount of funding to restore this composting program. Um, 
our members have a long history of advocacy in, in terms of textile and e-waste uh, re recycling and uh, have shown that the educational component is critical in, in, in its efficacy. Um, and yeah, th there's more, but I will submit this in a written form. Um, and you know, in closing today, I've made the case for the importance of immediately restoring um, drop-off sites and increasing the equity and access of drop-off sites and co-locating co drop-off sites and organic processing in the short term. But we reiterate the urgency of introducing legislation um, for mandatory organics and increased organics capa processing capacity citywide. Together, these pieces of legislation would enable access to convenient recycling of various waste, waste streams for all residents, diverting one third of waste from landfills, incinerators, polluting clusters of transfer stations and enabling New York to locally process organics and providing a lot of jobs to black and brown residents in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Dior St. Hilaire, followed by Justin Green, followed by Christine States Romero. Dior. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dior St. Hilaire, and I am the founder of Green Fiend, a Bronx-based environmental consulting firm using hip hop to teach sustainability through combos education and green technology. As a worker-owned cooperative through Green Fiend Organics, we adopt the principles of environmental justice, waste equity, and a circular economy. Our model is designed to collect and process organic waste locally. One NYC is a plan by the mayor's office for New York City to confront our climate crisis. However, the removal of the organic collection program through Mayor de Blasio's proposed budget is in direct conflict with these goals to be achieved by 2050. Our ability as a city to maintain these initiatives, even through adverse times, is what makes us a leader in the same district in which it was uh, generated. As a Bronx resident, I believe that organic waste should be collected and processed in the same district in which it was generated, considering only a few poor neighborhoods that are environmental justice communities bear the burden of the city's refuse, with the South Bronx being one of them. Access to drop off locations that accept food scrap and textile recycling in each community district can bring us closer to a more sustainable and equitable future, yet many other factors must be considered. Mandating a budget line item and having explicit language around resource allocation within DSNY's budget is imperative to ensure there are penalties for not prioritizing this effort in the future. Making sure that education and outreach has ample funding through community-based organizations to carry out the larger goal of diverting food waste from landfills. Ensuring that drop off locations within each community district are not cited in the neighborhoods with the low lowest median incomes. Out of the three drop-off locations, have at least one that actually processes the organic waste so it doesn't have to be trucked out. Making the hiring process for these drop-off sites transparent while mandating that MWBE businesses be allowed to participate in this effort. We must prioritize people of color who live in these neighborhoods to lead and control how the decisions that affect us are made as we increase local processing capacity. Saving the infrastructure that already exists is of supreme importance. While I see CORE Act as a step to mandatory curbside collection, which is really how we reach an equitable solution for New York City residents, we must fight to make sure we restore the $7 million of funding directed to community composting. There's an already established network, and we must honor the relationships built on the ground while figuring out how to grow this and allow access for others to get involved. I'm expired. You may not physically almost done to be uh, make it to a drop off location. And so whether it is because of disability or time constraints, we believe we must introduce and pass legislation mandating for citywide mandatory curbside organic collection. We envision a society where resources and benefits are equally shared and where people play a role in community decision making in proportion to the degree that they are affected. So in closing, we support intro 1942 and 1943 with the aforementioned amendments and see it as a stepping stone to a larger vision for an equitable waste system that does not put all the burden on just a few low income communities communities of color. I'll leave you with a rhyme for the time. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, equality. Climate solutions equal Black bodies. New institution equal alternative economy. Circular democratic and solidarity. The point is that the power lies with the people. Your contribution is equal. Don't pacify just to be cool. Let's, uh, let's support the truth, strategic in what we do. Pass the core act with some changes that are few. So be committed to NYC and how we see the future of our city green. But it takes a little more than just equity reflected in our hearts, money, and policies. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Justin Green, followed by Christine Dates Romero, followed by David Hurd. Justin? Starting time. Hi, I'm Justin Green. I'm the executive director of Big Reuse. Big Reuse is a nonprofit organization that works for zero waste in New York City through community composting outreach and our 
Reuse Center. We've created innovative social waste enterprises over the years, living uh, wage, green jobs, and job training op opportunities. And I wanted to thank uh, Jen Reynoso, Chair Cabrera, Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Lander, and everyone else who supported these efforts to reinstate uh, composting, uh, all the community groups out there. There's been so many, such an outpouring of support for composting. It's been um, really overwhelming to see that. We support the Big Reuse, the Core Act, um, to reopen and expand equitably, distribute food scrap drop-off sites for composting throughout New York City. Um, unstaffed food scrap drop-off sites are a cost-effective way to provide access to composting for New Yorkers. Um, composting is really an essential service that should continue to be funded. The climate crisis in 2020 is on track to be the hottest uh, year on record for the planet. The impacts of climate change will hit low communities around the world the hardest. Those communities will suffer devastating consequences from our inaction as one of the wealthiest and most influential cities in the world. Funding um, uh, saved by cutting uh, curbside composting and community composting accounted for approximately 26 million the equivalent of just 12 days of NYPD overtime last year. We could reinstate all composting for 12 days of NYPD overtime. Um, organic waste in landfills generates methane. Methane is 86 times more powerful than carbon uh, dioxide at, at warming the earth over two decades. And it greatly increases warming because of that power of absorbing radiation. Uh, mandatory curbside and collection, uh, Curbside collection and community composting are essential. It should be reinstated uh, immediately as part of our responsibility to fight climate change. If mandatory uh, curbside can't be immediately reestablished, the CORE Act will help New York City get back on track. In order to achieve the goals of the CORE Act, the $7 million of the current budget cuts to community composting and community food scrap drop offs. Time expired. Uh, 175 drop off sites could be reestablished while operating community composting sites such at, as Big Reuse. Uh, so we applaud your efforts and uh, really think we need to keep going with reinstating the, the current funding and, and the core act as well. So thank you. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for the previous panel? If so, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next panel. We'll hear from Christine Dates Romero, followed by David Hurd, followed by CC Panita. Christine? Starting time. Christine? Yes, sorry. I, Great. I thought the, the, the host will unmute you. Mute me. Okay, um, we'll start all over again. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Christina Dats Romero. I'm the executive director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center, who started its programs in 1987 by offering community based recycling opportunities for paper bottles, cans, uh, by creating drop off programs. Today, we provide e waste and composting services, environmental stewardship opportunities, and educational programming. We are testifying in support of the CORE Act to implement community based recycling drop off opportunities that create equitable access to environmental programs and green jobs while reducing the burden of truck traffic to waste transfer stations located in communities of color. The city needs to immediately restore the $7 million cut that were made to CRONYC and New York City Compost Project partners, which the Ecology Center is part of. These existing programs offer 170 food scrap drop-off sites across the five boroughs and compost education to hundreds of community groups to, pill, to build up their own com, uh, composting programs. The implementation of the CORE Act allows for an opportunity to build on what was created over the last 30 years. For that, the existing program needs to stay in place. The Ecology Center has run a community-based composting program since 1990 and has uh, been the Manhattan partner of the New York City Compost Project since 2005. 
Each week, we serve approximately 3,500 households through 10 drop-off locations within a three-mile radius of the East River Park compost yard. We have created a hyperlocal closed loop system distributing the finished compost to local community gardens and parks. The program contributes directly to the health of our community, creates green jobs and job training op opportunities and offers commu community engagement and education. The core act is a vehicle to create more community drop off offs in the five boroughs and we urge that together with creating drop off opportunities, efforts should, be made, efforts should be made to create local processing capacity for organic waste. In closing, we would like to urge the city council to restore the $7 million in FY21 for community-based composting and education programs, implement the CORE Act by including more local composting processing sites and pass legislation for a mandatory organics collection program. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from David Hurd, followed by CC Panita, followed by Kathy Nazari. David. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso, Co-Chair um, Co uh, Cabrera, and Council Member Powers and members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the CORE Act today. My name is David Hurd, and I am the Director of Zero Waste Programs at Grow NYC. Grow NYC has played a pivotal role in helping improve the environmental quality of life in New York City for 50 years. Personally, I have been working in recycling and composting in New York City since 1980. The proposed executive budget eliminates organic recycling in New York City, as well as additional BSNY services designed to reduce sending waste to landfills. These eliminations undercut the progress the city has made in diverting food scraps and yard waste from landfills, a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. The elimination of all funding for recycling, outreach, and education and composting of organic waste is short-sighted and will have long-term negative implications, setting the city back further from its goals of zero waste to landfills, greenhouse gas reduction, and environmental justice. We have seen what happens when recycling programs are terminated. You don't go back to square one, you move behind it. The residential recycling program in New York City has yet to achieve the levels of landfill diversions it had prior to 2001 before the portions of the program were suspended by Mayor Bloomberg after 9-11. We support the ambitious and equitable goals of the CORE Act. However, in order to create the community recycling centers proposed in the Act, we believe that the top priority and urgent need is for the City Council to restore the $6.3 million in funding to Grow NYC and the New York City Compost Project that is proposed to be cut in the fiscal 21 budget. This restoration could bring back 175 food scrap drop-off sites that we collectively managed when activities were suspended in, on March 22nd. This would bring the City Council very close to the core act goal of 177 sites. Without restoring funding, these bills will be unable to achieve their objectives. The eight organizations affected by these cuts represent the backbone of community-based recycling and composting in New York City. The funding for Grow NYC Zero Waste Schools program has also been eliminated and represents an additional $972,000 not reflected in the proposed budget cut of $2.8 million for recycling education. We request that this funding be restored as well. This restoration will be critical as New York City public schools are anticipated to reopen in September. Organic tonnage is improved by 103% on zero waste school routes compared to 22% on non-zero waste. I'm expired. Routes. The core act is... The CORE Act is sensible legislation that we support, but that we see as a second step after restoring funding to Grow NYC and the New York City Compost Project to continue to move our city closer towards zero waste in an equitable manner. We cannot squander the progress and waste diversion we have made over the past three decades and must restore the budget cuts to community-based composting and recycling education and pass the CORE Act to bridge us to the future of citywide mandatory curbside collection. I would like to thank Chairman Reynoso and the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today and for proposing this important legislation and look forward to working with you and its implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from CC Panita, followed by Kathy Nazari, followed by Matthew M. Savello. Starting time. CC. Good afternoon. My name is Ceci Panetta and I'm the executive director of BK Rot. We are New York City's first bike powered food waste hauling and composting service. Our project is staffed by young people of color in Bushwick. A special thanks to our council member Reynoso, CM Powers and others for advancing this critical issue. At BK Rot, we understand how interlinked our environmental and climate crises are to the systemic violence against black, indigenous and brown communities. We started as a grassroots response to a lack of composting options, excess waste infrastructure, and high unemployment rates for black and brown youth in Bushwick. We strive to create a just and regenerative model that invests in our soils and our community. Mayor de Blasio's proposed cuts eliminate several services essential to community health. 
Today, I call attention to the concerning cuts to organics recycling. Over a third of the city's waste is compostable, yet sending this material to landfills amplifies toxic air black and brown communities breathe and contributes to lasting climate impacts, which disproportionately impacts these same communities around the world. We ask the council to take the following actions to advance community composting options and equity. Immediately restore at least 7 million of funding towards community composting to support operating over 170 drop-off sites, community education, and local processing sites. We urge an additional expansion, expansion of funds for community outreach, education, and composting options to serve communities of color previously excluded from DSNY's composting services. The council can easily fund this by following calls from black organizers to reallocate at minimum $1 billion from the NYPD budget and instead invest them in the well being and health of, of black communities. BKROP supports the CORE Act and we propose the following recommendations. We urge the city to invest in local facilities to process organic waste. This reduces economic, environmental, and health costs transporting materials longer distances and also makes finished compost readily available for community use. Closed loop models offer communities local employment opportunities as well as the I'm expired. composting. Just a few more points on this. This is a critical educational component that transforms our relationship to waste while also increasing local food and climate resilience. Also, our collection vehicles must be zero or low emissions vehicles, which cre also creates local employment opportunities and reduces local air pollution and carbon emissions. Our collection sites should um, be equally distributed with consistent hours and ideally staffed by local community members who are best fit to communicate and educate their neighbors. We must prioritize serving communities like NYCHA residents historically left out of easily available composting options. We recommend hiring local community members to leading community engagement and education campaigns for successful participation. Lastly, the city should ensure community composting organizations and social enterprises are supported in continuing to build the systems and infrastructure to guarantee that all New Yorkers have access to organics recycling and composting. There is a wealth of knowledge and resources held among those of us who have been collecting organic waste and maximizing our efficiency and capacity to process organic waste into compost on small plots of land. We recommend the committee engage these stakeholders in development of the CORE Act. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for the previous panel? If so, use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no council member questions, we'll move on to the next panel. First, we'll hear from Kathy Nazari. Next, we'll hear from Matthew M. Savello. And then we'll hear from Meredith Danberg Piccarelli. Kathy? Time begins now. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon, Chair Renoso, Councilman Powers, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Kathy Mazzari, County Committee Woman and Concerned Citizen. I urge you to pass Intros 1942 and 1943. We all know we're in a climate crisis and that Blacks and Hispanics are at increased risk of the devastating health impacts and premature death due to toxic colonialism. While COVID-19 has put the city on pause, neither the climate crisis nor resultant deaths will wait for us to return to normal. So I commend you for getting us back on track with composting. The pandemic taught us the need to find equitable, cost-efficient, multi-dimensional solutions that require working together as a community. How can we do it expeditiously? Step one, restore the roughly 175 grow NYC drop-offs. Two, have drop-off and processing at the same location. This would eliminate transport and process fees as well as carbon emissions. Nearly two thirds of the city's 536 community gardens have the infrastructure to collect and compost on site. While not all have the same capacity, they can scale up with minimal funding from DSNY for equipment and staff. For this to work, the gardens must have legislative protection from real estate developers. Three, include the nearly half of the DOE's 1800 schools citywide plus universities that compost and enlist local nonprofits, block associations, bids, and community boards that want to help. Four, Composting must be equitable. 
let's scale up NYCHA's urban farm and garden composting for NYCHA residents. Res residents should be hired to run it, funded by DSNY after completing free training from Green City Force. Doing it on site creates a closed loop system. It also addresses their lease issue and their I'm inspired. Almost done. There is interest if done equitably. Five, set up drop-offs in grocery store parking lots in the outer boroughs. Six, create a rebate program for private carters who already have the infrastructure to pick up some multifamily buildings. I've shared some of these ideas with the speaker and council staff, and I'm happy to work with you on it. In order for this to work, there must be ample funding for education, including for buildings and folks like myself who want to do it at home. I would also ask that the sites be operational by October 31st. Lastly, let's bring back the safe drop-off sites for E and hazardous waste. I thank you for your time. Please pass intros 1942 and 1943. Chair Renoso, I hope you feel better soon, and thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Matthew M. Savello, followed by Meredith Danberg Ficarelli, followed by Emily Bachman. Matthew? Time, time begins now. <clears throat> My name is Matthew Savello, and I am chair of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board and the, the MSWAB. <clears throat> I am testifying on its behalf regarding intros 1942 and 43, otherwise known as the CORE Act. Mayor de Blasio's proposed fiscal year 2021 budget that eliminates residential organics collection and processing program in the city of New York has left 3.5 million New York City residents, many of whom live in Manhattan with no alternative but to place their organic waste into the landfill or incinerator bound garbage. The emails received by the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board over the past several weeks indicates that this has been a difficult adjustment for many New York City residents who participated in these important programs. As these programs sit dormant, they become more difficult to restart and we stand to lose much of the hard earned dedication and behavior change in residents who participated in them. If they are not restored, the city is throwing away a foundation that could eventually support a successful mandatory curbside organics diversion program Implementing an effective organics collection and processing program is the single most important step New York City can take to achieve its stated goal of sending zero waste to landfill and incineration. Given the severity of the budget cut crisis that New York City faces, there is a sensible path forward to ensure that we can preserve and protect the progress we have made in collecting and diverting organics. First, the budget cuts to the community composting program should be restored. This would require a small $7 million to restore Grow NYC program and New York City Compost Project partners and a significant portion of the 170 drop-off and community education sites in operation before the cuts. For Manhattan, this funding restoration would re reactivate the vital composting and processing education and outreach of two major composting facilities, the Lower East Side Ecology Center and on Governor's Island Earth Matter. Both of these crucial members of the New York City Compost Project have provided education and outreach to tens of thousands of New York City residents over the years. Second, following the restoration of this funding, the next important step is to pass intros 1942 and 43, the CORE Act, the subject of this hearing, implementing the CORE Act would move the city closer to a goal of zero waste to landfill and incineration in a more equitable manner. Intro 42, 1942 would extend food and yard waste drop-off locations to areas previously not served by the program by establishing three drop-off locations per community district. The Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board supports this equitable extension. We request that intro 1942 be amended to specify that all material collected at the drop-off sites be sent to the refunded compost projects and amended to ensure that the continuation of important education, outreach and technical community support for gardens and composting efforts. Intro 43, 1943 provides for the equitable distribution of three textile recycling centers in each community district. The Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board supports this expansion. Third, we look forward to seeing the council introduce legislation committing the city to a mandatory residential curbside organics collection program that would represent a significant step towards a zero waste New York City. We thank Chair Reynoso and their members of the committee for consideration of our testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Meredith Danberg Ficarelli, followed by Emily Bachman, followed by Claire Fontaine. Meredith? Time begins now. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith Danberg Ficarelli. I'm the director of Common Ground Compost LLC. We are a zero waste services company helping businesses and residents divert food scraps and recyclables from landfills. And we run Reclaimed Organics, a bicycle powered micro hauling operation that serves businesses and residents in Manhattan. Since the mayor defunded residential organics programs, we've played an educational and coordination role among new and emerging micro haulers and processors. Enterprising individuals from across the boroughs have reached out to us for advice and guidance to build and launch organics diversion programs so, and services in their communities in response to the sudden void of food scrap drop-offs and curbside collection. Uh, organics are special. Unlike plastic, glass, metal, and paper that are most effectively processed in massive volumes to achieve economies of scale, organics can remain even within an individual's apartment and be effectively recycled. Food scraps can be walked to community gardens or collected by foot and bike, consolidated for processing in community scale compost facilities. Organics can be organized at micro scale transfer stations to be collected and processed at commercial scale near the city. Rather than just talking about it, we should build a system that keeps 100% of the city's organic waste within 150 miles of the city. This goal would require investment in education, job training, and infrastructure. This approach would also create many more employment opportunities that are currently involved in our city's waste management supply chain, one that disproportionately burdens low-income communities and depends on so-called waste energy facilities and far-flung landfills. We must take every opportunity to make the best of the economic disaster we're currently living through. We urge the city to, at an absolute minimum, restore $7 million to allow Grow NYC and the formerly known as NYC Compost Project sites to immediately reopen. With equal urgency, we ask the city to expand the drop-off locations to include communities that were not previously served. Climate change will affect all of us, and the services we provide to mitigate the impacts of climate change must also be, ex be available to all. Time These is expired should not be limited to residential organics, just one more point, uh, but should have the opportunity to generate revenue to support the employment opportunities they're in. A suggested fee structure, standard operating procedures, safety guidelines, training toolkits, troubleshooting, and of course data collection tools can all be developed and provided by the city. Individuals can be empowered to educate their neighbors about why composting and organics diversion matter, um, and a variety of other reuse, repair, and other diversion programs can also be centered at these sites. Thank you for your time, Council Member Reno. So I hope you feel better. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for the previous panel? If so, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next panel. First, we'll hear from Emily Bachman, followed by Claire Fontaine, followed by Oliver Wright. Emily? All right. Time begins now. Thank you, Chair Reynoso and members of this committee for allowing me to voice support for intro 1942 of the CORE Act today. My name is Emily Bachman and I'm here as a representative of the New York City Community Composting Coalition on behalf of over 7,000 New Yorkers who have signed our petition to save community composting. We appreciate that the CORE Act seeks to reopen, expand, and equitably distribute food scrap drop-off sites throughout the city during the extended suspension of the curbside organics program. And we agree with the CORE Act's underlying principles that composting is an essential service that must continue to be funded in the New York City budget and that food scrap drop-off sites are the most cost-effective way to maintain access to this service for all New Yorkers. As others have noted, I. As others have noted, I cannot stress enough that successful implementation of the CORE Act requires that we first reverse $7 million of proposed budget cuts that eliminate all funding for Grown YC Zero Waste Programs and New York City Compost Project, altogether eight nonprofit organizations that could restart services immediately and begin to expand once the CORE Act is passed. In the last few months, our city has made short-sighted budget decisions that effectively abandon our commitments to zero waste, climate resilience, and environmental justice. By eliminating all public funding for residential composting, the proposed budget creates a landscape where composting is only available to pri privileged New Yorkers with the ability to pay private companies to do the work our city should do. If you haven't seen a food scrap drop-off site before, the photo behind me is of the largest one in the country, Grand Army Plaza, Brooklyn, where 900 New Yorkers were bringing over 3,000 pounds of food scraps each week, 
all of which were composted by New York City Compost Project hosted by Earth Matter on Governor's Island. I'm highlighting just one of 170 citywide food scrap drop-off sites. Time has expired. And just one of six local processing sites that have been cut from the sanitation budget since March and that will remain closed for at least the next year if the current budget, if the current proposed budget does not change. But that could reopen immediately following reversal of these budget cuts. So I'll skip the rest and just thank you guys for listening to us and thinking creatively about cost effective community based solutions to composting and recognizing that we have to find a creative way to continue doing this work. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Claire Fontaine, followed by Oliver Wright, followed by Wiley Goodman. Claire? Time begins now. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, all right, good. Uh, my name is Claire Fontaine. I live in the uh, East Village area in Village East Towers. Uh, we had recently implemented the, the uh, Brown Bins program. Uh, it took about a year to persuade uh, everybody to get involved in it. And now it's been pulled out from under the rug uh, from us, uh, which is difficult because a lot of people have gotten used to the idea of being able to recycle their organics and they do not have any place to do it. Um, implementing the CORE Act would go uh, a long way in, in helping people continue with this process. I mean, the thing is, is you just can't cut people off, you know, put them on the shelf for 14 months and then, you know, expect them to be able to, you know, come back at full street full stream. Uh, they're just not going to be able to do that. Uh, and you also have all the personnel who have, you know, have been working with the communities on these projects. And they're really important and their skills and their experience is important. And if you put that on the side, you're going to lose a great deal of that. And it's like a waste. It's a not just a waste of money. It's a waste of human human potential. Uh, it's it's human capital and that is it's it's just in every which way it is very unwise to do that and the core act will provide uh you know if you give the seven million dollars you will be able to help people continue to recycle their ways to learn new things uh to you know, keep these community activities um, going. And otherwise, you know, otherwise carting all this stuff off to a land, more money. So anyway, uh, it's a penny wise pound foolish. Thank you. And thank you to the committee for uh, this hearing. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Oliver Wright followed by Wiley Goodman, followed by Elsa Higby. Oliver? Time begins now. Good afternoon, Chair Reynoso and members of the committee. Uh, my name's Oliver Wright. I'm representing Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board. We're a volunteer citizens organization whose members are appointed by the borough president to advise on waste matters. And we're also a member of the Save Our Compost Coalition. Uh, thanks for taking the time to hear our testimony and for the good work that you're all doing uh, more broadly. Um, so first of all, we believe that the immediate focus should be on refunding and reopening the organics drop-off sites and NYC compost project programs that were closed due to the May budget cuts in March. As has been stated, the $7 million is a drop in the ocean of overall budget cuts in terms of savings, and it leaves no city-funded residential organics programs. It also threatens to, to reverse years of hard work on this matter. Um, secondly, we support the CORE Act um, and its passing as, a, as an important next step in improving waste equity and reducing environmental injustice. Um, 
with regards to intro 1942, we would echo Manhattan Borough President Brewer's uh, statements about proximity to, uh, to NYCHA developments and see that as an, an important part of uh, environmental equity. And um, we'd also like to see as many of the drop off sites as possible have um, processing either on site or nearby uh, and for the finished compost to be made available to the community as a resource. Um, this not only brings social benefits, but also uh, would reduce truck journeys, particularly to transfer stations, which are a, a key part of environmental justice as has been uh, highlighted. We'd like to see a rollout plan um, for the, the new sites in terms of staffing, resourcing and locations, and also ideally a phased opening rather than lots of sites coming online in a year's time. Um, Turning to intro 1943, we understand the focus will be on textiles um, and while further access to textiles is good, um, provided it's complementary to uh, existing streams, we don't want electronics and hazardous waste to be forgotten about because these are key streams that are currently very much underserved. Um, residents are risking fines by illegal dumping given the lack of uh, means of disposing of the, these items um, and that itself uh, is a social I'm injustice. Inspired. Thank you, almost done. Um, so yeah, in summary, we'd like to see the uh, the refunding of uh, of the the compost sites that were closed and the passing of the core act. Thank you very much. Thank you. If any council members have questions for the previous panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Chair Cabrera. One second. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicole. At uh, this moment, I want to pass the baton uh, to uh, our new co-chair, uh, just uh, Councilmember Justin Brannon, uh, who's going to be joining us uh, today. We're doing a teamwork uh, to help our chair uh, Reynoso uh, making this hearing happen. So thank you uh, to all of the advocates uh, who are here today. We will continue, and I and with that, I pass it on. Uh, to my good friend, council member, uh, Justin Brannan, who's also a member of this committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, committee council, do we have questions from members? I can't see. No, no council members have their hands raised. Okay, we have another panel? Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next panel then. Great. Next, we'll hear from Wiley Goodman followed by Elsa Higby, followed by Anna DeLuco. Riley? Time begins now. Thank you, Chairman Reynoso and Council Member uh, Powers for your leadership and for the Sanitation and Solid Waste Management Committee for your consideration of this testimony. My name is Wiley Goodman. I'm the chair of the Queen Solid Waste Advisory Board Organizing Committee, a sister organization in Manhattan and Brooklyn SWABs. I'm here today on behalf of our diverse multi-sector organization to advocate restored funding to the New York City Compost Project, Grow NYC's organic and textile drop-off sites and DSNY e-waste collection events, as well as passing the CORE Act to ensure waste recovery equity. While we understand proposed cuts were made in response to the $9 billion budget gap predicated by COVID-19, we believe these austerity measures will exacerbate health and quality of life disparities linked to race and income that our group is committed to address and is thus the wrong response at this urgent moment. However, taking the argument at its face, we challenge the fiscal rationale for these cuts by showing that purported savings will be offset by economic, environmental, and social costs and conclude, that by, con and conclude by contending that even if programs are spared, the core act is still needed to reach all New Yorkers. Programs at risk cost $7 million per year. Once cut, however, this money will not simply be recouped. That's because nearly 100 New Yorkers employed by these programs will lose their jobs, leading to unemployment benefits for furloughed workers, reduced tax revenue, and economic multiplier losses to the businesses from which these workers and organizations purchase. There will also be added waste export costs. In 2019, the city spent $41 million taking residential school and governmental trash to landfills. That same year, these threatened programs collected 17,000 tons of textiles, 2,300 tons of organics, and 1,056 tons of hazardous materials. Transporting these to landfills will cost approximately 3.34 million, reducing by nearly half the $7 million savings. We also look, need to look at sunk capital costs. These include construction of the Staten Island Compost Facility to increase local and regional processing of food and yard waste in the Gowanus Community Composting Facility, able to accept three tons of material per week. This infrastructure left dormant will cost more to activate after a year delay. 
Social and environmental benefits will also fall to the wayside with programmatic cuts. Time has expired. Uh, quickly, among them, annual failure to distribute 500 tons of compost to 12,000 residents, loss of finished compost to 500 street trees, lack of engagement of 7,200 volunteers providing over 30,000 hours of community service and losses not considered in the city's number crunching exercise. Rather than resort to short-term panic selling of community composting, textile collections, and e-waste in light of COVID-19, we need to reinvest in the one NYC goal to become the most resilient, equitable, and sustainable city in the world and send at least 90% less waste to landfills by the year 2030. That means making organic collections mandatory, as Council Speaker Johnson recommended before the pandemic. In truth, we would soon have no choice but to accept, adopt innovative strategies around waste disposal. China no longer wants our recyclables. U.S. cities no longer want our pretrustables. If we don't solve, reduce, reuse, and recycle soon, we're looking at far, far higher costs down the road, which the city says it can ill afford. Again, thank you we, uh, for the council uh, and the committee for hearing our testimony. We wish Anthony, uh, Council Member Reno, so well. We want to thank the Queens Council members who have signed on to the Core Act, Constantinides, Grudenchik, Valone, Van Bramer, and as we learned uh, just before this uh, session, uh, Donovan Richards. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Elsa Higby, followed by Anna DeLuco, followed by Pierre Simmons. Elsa? Time begins now. Hi, uh, just a point of protocol before my time starts. Most of us testifying today were not made aware of the two minute time limit. So everyone has prepared three minutes. Um, if, if my time could start again, I will start now. Thank you, Chair Reynoso, members of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee and members of the council for hearing us today. The objective of legislation 1942 of the CORE Act is the provision of equitable access to food scrap drop-offs. The objective of the mayor is to drastically cut the city's budget. The two competing objectives are a recipe for meaningless implementation of legislation that has strong values, but will not provide the equity that is inherent in mandatory curbside composting. If equity is the goal, Let's not spend money on a new program that does not have infrastructure and no staff to plan its implementation. Let's put the funds back into New York City Compost Project and Grow NYC so that we can maintain the infrastructure, skills, and community networks already in place to build up core if mandatory curbside is not possible. I am Elsa Higby, the project manager of the New York City Compost Project hosted by Queens Botanical Garden. The New York City Compost Project is the foundation of the city's organics movement, and it is a nationally recognized program. Our staff consists of three award recipients from the United States Composting Council. Our master composter certificate course has been copied many times across the United States. And most council members have not heard of us because we are not a legal entity and do not seek direct relationships with council members. Yet, the compost project is arguably the most successful melding of grassroots initiatives and publicly funded programming that the city has ever seen. All of the existing community hosted food scrap drop-offs were recruited from the networks of the seven New York City compost project host sites. While the 175 sites may not have been distributed three per council district, they represented an infrastructure that was built from the bottom up, residents and community groups stepping forward to participate in making New York City a better, greener place. Time is expired. And the New York City Compost Project is their only support. Over 70% of the staff at Compost Project have come out of volunteer opportunities created by the Compost Project, and 50% of them are master composters. My colleagues have come up through green job training programs, AmeriCorps, volunteerism, and many of them have moved on to work for DSNY, micro haulers, the Department of Environmental Protection, Parks, Randalls Island, Rutgers, and the list goes on. If you haven't noticed, I'm painting the picture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have hired from New York City residents and from the diverse pool of people who have come forward and said, I want to be part of this. I want to make my city a better place. Passing core without reinstating the budgets for New York City Compost Project and Grow NYC food scrap drop-offs is trading on deep, venerable community engagement for check-the-box equity that does little to broaden community awareness and empowerment. 
Real equity for food scrap collection is making curbside mandatory. The foundation for an equitable program that can succeed in the interim is maintaining New York City Compost Project's local outreach, education, and technical support, allowing its staff to plan for expansion into the aspirations of CORE when the budget allows for it. Thank you. Thank you. If any council members have questions for the previous panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next panel. First, we'll hear from Anna DeLuco, followed by Pierre Simmons, followed by Beverly Crosby. Anna? Time begins now. Yeah. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Josefa Marín. Uh, Soy recicladora y también soy miembro de la Junta Directiva de Churriquén. Pido que Ana de Lucas me traduzca mi testimonio, por favor. Um, good afternoon, my name is Josefa Marín and I am a recycler and a member of the Churriquén Board of Directors. I ask Ana de Luco me to translate my testimony. I support the CORE Act because I live and work in North Brooklyn, in the council district represented by Antonio Reynoso, an area that suffers from environmental, economic, and social injustice. The CORE Act will ensure that we have a place to deposit our organics, electronics, and any other material that needs to be recycled. It will help ensure that the responsibility we all have to manage our waste and recycling is distributed throughout the city. The Core Act will improve the health of waste pickers. Organic products attract pests and electronic waste contains chemicals that are harmful to human health. I support the CORE Act in continuing to keep our neighborhoods clean. The community centers that would be created under this law would give work to more people and educate the community. I know this because it has happened already at Sure Weekend, the only nonprofit recycling center in New York that has existed for 12 years. Last year, more than 700 earned income through their work and more than 200 students from kindergarten to college level visited Sure Weekend. Time has expired. Sure Weekend is supporting to the creation of a circular economy to achieve a fairer tomorrow, leaving new generations with a cleaner and more sustainable plan, planet. In addition, Sure Weekend is training us recyclers to develop our own initiative to open new centers. My husband and I are prepared and eager to take responsibility for managing a Sure Weekend extension, which could be one of the new centers that CORE proposes. Again, all our support for the CORE Act because it is a step forward in doing the work we already do, cleaning our neighbors, neighborhoods, promoting health, creating green jobs, educating and empowering our community to solve urgent problems like the waste management, as well as the environmental, economic, and social injustice we live in today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Pierre Simmons, followed by Beverly Crosby, followed by Helena Whitaker. Pierre? Starting time. Okay, we switched places, Pierre and I. So uh, my name is Beverly Crosby and yes, we at Sure We Can fully support the CORE Act thanks to Chairman Powers and Reynoso for your proposal. We believe that the implementation of this legislation is doable. We at Sure We Can are doing it. 
In 2015, a group of graduate students at Parsons New School researched strategies for the implementation of the Zero Waste 2030 plan and came to a clear and simple proposal to have 60 Shuri cans, which they described as civic waste centers, basically what today has been proposed. After more than 10 years of doing a worthy job for the city, of providing income for hundreds of people who struggle to survive in an informal economy and also some green jobs empowering the community without taxpayer money. We have requested funds from you, the city council, to help us secure the site in order to continue our work, work that will help you implement this proposed legislation for the site for which we are now being threatened with eviction. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Pierre Simmons, followed by Helena Whitaker, followed by Marissa to Dominica. Pierre? Starting time. Uh, just oh. the answer we hear that you cannot help us because we did not have the required contracts a minimum of $50,000 for the last three years. Yes, you are right. We do not have city contracts. The city has not offered and will not offer contracts for the main work we do because the city made a contract to handle recycling with a multi-million dollar mining Australian corporation for 20 years. So we know we cannot get any city contract for the job for at least the next 10 years, if ever. But in 2015, with funds from the Speakers Initiative Communities of Color Nonprofit Stabilization Fund, thanks, Mr. Speaker, we developed a community compost program in response to a great need of the city in order to create more green jobs, more resources for our community. Then we supplied no, then we applied to the city for $50,000 to keep running the program. And because it was not self-sustaining, we got $5,000, thanks. From then on, we kept asking sanitation if we could apply for any program. They only, they offer for compost. The answer, nothing is offered. The city signed a contract for more than a billion and a half dollars with SIMS, a foreign corporation, and yet can't, cannot give us 1,300,000 to its constituents who are trying to find ways of living with dignity and self-reliance in the midst of a terribly unjust economic system. And all because of requirements you made impossible to obtain. We were unable to meet under such conditions, the term a knee- Time expired. A knee braced to the neck takes on a different connotation with the same result. What we have seen these, these past days, what so many voices are shouting on the streets is exactly what we feel today before you. We're not begging. We're just asking for what is just, but refusing to give us what belongs to us, city allocated funds, which we badly need just once to continue doing self-sustaining and much needed environmental work to continue living. And I wanna thank you. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for this previous panel? If so, please use the Zoom hand raise function now. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next panel. First, we'll hear from Helena Whitaker, followed by Marissa D. Dominicus, followed by Jeff Twine. Helena? Starting time. Hello, I, my name is Helena Whitaker. I am a resident of Gowanus, and I'm submitting this testimonial to ask you to please allocate the budget fairly 
and help save composting and other social programs in New York City. As a citizen pruner, a garden committee member for our block association, and one of the tree stewards of our block, I can attest that we benefit tremendously from the full cycle of the city compost, from collection to use of the final product. On our 12th street block, we have 24 tree beds with healthy mature trees. The beds are beautifully planted and maintained by the residents of our block, working as a group on weekends. Every spring, we pick up the best compost and mulch from our sponsors, the Guanus Canal Conservancy. Last year, we entered the Brooklyn Botanical Garden's Greenest Block in Brooklyn, whoo, Greenest Block in Brooklyn competition for the first time and were semi-finalists on our first year of planting and beautifying our block. None of this would have been possible without the city compost and mulch processed here in our neighborhood by the GCC. Our neighborhood as a whole has been practicing curbside composting for years and has incorporated the practice as an int integral part of the Sunday routine, almost as brushing your teeth. It felt right to be actively participating on the curbside collection program and having so little garbage. I used to brag about it to friends who did not have the program available in their neighborhoods. We spent years being conditioned to compost and recycle and it is unthinkable to go back to placing all organic matter in the garbage. We are counting on your support to restore the 7 million funds, implement the core act and continue funding for community composting programs and curbside composting now, which will not only benefit directly our streets, our streets, tree beds and community gardens will create new green jobs and in the bigger picture will support broad efforts for environmental justice and, cl and climate change. It is, is not an option, it is crucial. Make curbside food scraps mandatory. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Marissa De Dominicus, followed by Jeff Twine, followed by Adam Brukowitz. Marissa? Starting time. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Council, for this opportunity to speak. I'm Marissa De Dominicus, I'm co founder and ED for the I'm sorry, Martha, we're having some technical issues hearing you. Hold on one moment. Do you want to try speaking again? Sure. Is this better? Yes, that sounds better. Thank you. Okay, sure. Good afternoon and thank you, Council, for this opportunity to speak. I'm Marissa D. Dominicus. I'm the ED and co-founder of Earth Matter. We're located on Governor's legislation that we're providing. I'm sorry, the audio is, is jumbled again. I think um, someone from IT will reach out to you and we'll circle back to you after the next panelist, if that's all right. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Jeff Twine. Starting time. For over 40 years, I've been president of Upper West Side Recycling. I was also secretary of a committee that coordinated the activities of all voluntary recycling okay. centers in New York. Do you hear me? Um, I participated in meetings with DSNY when they were planning their recycling programs. I served as co-chair of the Manhattan Swab Presidential Committee during the 1990s. So I'm very familiar with how recycling has changed over the years. I wanna emphasize that all the materials collected by DSNY were first recycled by community groups and nonprofits. These groups built up a base of participants, educated the public and sparked interests that would later enable DSNY to take over the collection of recyclables on a larger scale. This is also the case now with food scrap composting, eliminating private sector options would only make it more difficult for DSNY when they restart the program next June. Therefore, it's really important to remain retain funding, funding now for Grow NYC, Lower East Side Equality, Big Reuse, and other members of the Compost Project. Organics recycling is, is in its infancy, as recycling of metal and glass was in the 1970s. 
People who have been recycling their food scraps through DSNY are committed and enthusiastic. They'd feel betrayed if they had no alternatives, if they were forced to throw food scraps in the garbage for an entire year. If they felt betrayed, they'd be less likely to participate in future food scrap collection, less likely to interest neighbors to do the same. Thus, we'd lose much of the momentum that's been built up in the food scrap collection movement. Also, continuing to fund the compost project now will enable its members to maintain the infrastructure that's been built up. The trucks, containers, drop-off locations, staffing, outreach, and planning necessary for food scrap collection. Cutting this relatively tiny amount of support for the compost project would be a giant step backwards for the city. Longer term, we need to revisit how DS and Y food scraps is structured. I'm expired. I believe that the only way to do that is by having mandatory recycling. We get also uh, mandatory composting. Uh, we, through that, we could eliminate a lot of the, uh, the collection of, of garbage and save city money the other way. We also would address uh, the rat problem, a big health issue. Thank you very much for letting me testify. I will be submitting uh, written testimony uh, as, as well. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Adam Rukowitz, followed by Michael Lampariello, followed by Danette Rivera. Adam? Starting time. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm Adam Barucas. I run Wearable Collections, a leading clothing and textile recycling company based out of Brooklyn. Um, we've been the backbone of the New York City Green Market Collections since 2008. We've grown the collections from one market a week to 34 markets per week over that time span. What started out as a proof of concept has grown to be part of the fabric of waste management in NYC. Our company started by placing bins inside of residential buildings to make clothing recycling as easy as plastic, glass, and paper. Uh, we've seen that business grow to over 250 buildings citywide. We've also partnered with DOE Office of Sustainability to host clothing drives with over 100 schools. Wherever we believe we can create a convenient collection hub, we seek to operate. There's been no better partner for us than growing NYC has led the way on niche uh, waste management. The green markets have proven to be a perfect hub for waste co collection. The collections have grown to around 1 million pounds annually from green markets alone. Well, my question how important textile collections are to the city. Textiles and clothing make up 6% of the residential waste stream. It's not a gigantic percentage, but significant 200,000 tons a year. But there is more to the story which my 15 years experience has taught me. Clothing is the best gateway material to opening eyes for the value of our waste stream. People understand the value of clothing. They have a good sense of another life that the clothing have when they're done with it through the years of donating clothing. People love to tell stories of the life they live in the clothing. As a waste manager, specifically of clothing, but well-versed in how other materials are handled, I can see how waste management is very formulaic and it necessitates efficient collections and dot connecting to find value of the materials making them worth collecting. Considering there's a cost for dumping our garbage, every pound that recyclers keep out of landfills and in motion saves the city money. Once people learn about the value of how clothing's value is kept through efficient distribution, their minds can better translate how materials like plastics, glass, and organics have better lives ahead of them as well when they're finished and make them consider their consumptive habits in general. We all seek a greener NYC and textile recycling plays a key role in raising awareness and education of the value of our waste stream. I hope the council can see this and reinstitute zero waste program. I fully support the CORE Act. Thank you. Thank you. If any council members have questions at this time, they should use the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no questions, next we'll hear from Michael Lampariello, followed by Sarah Han, followed by Christopher Gattis. Michael? Starting time. Good afternoon, all. My name is Konstantia Malashinska, and I'm a sustainability consultant at Two Trees Management, who manages Domino Park in Williamsburg with New York City Parks. I am testifying on behalf of Two Trees Management and Domino Park today, specifically Park Director Mike Lamparello. On June 1st, Domino opened its internal organics processing operation to drop us from the public. The decision was made after discussions with local partners, such as North Brooklyn neighbors, and our council members, Reynoso and Levin, who heard from many distraught constituents. Today, Domino has had five two-hour collection windows and each broke a record set by the previous one. Last Thursday, for example, we collected more in one day than in three previous days combined for a current total of 2,000 pounds from 
400 community members. Though well utilized, our mission-driven and privately funded operation is not enough and only highlights the crisis that the SNY budget cuts created. I help sort through the beautiful, resource-rich community scraps brought to us. We have had repeat visitors from as far as Forest Hills and Queens, the Bronx and Manhattan, who've brought months worth of scraps. We heard from folks who researched and found us to be one of the three or so open facilities accepting scraps at no fee. I am as proud of this as I am heartbroken. New York City is a frontline community of a climate emergency, social and racial justice emergency, and a public health emergency. We need to integrate the city's fiscal bottom line with environmental and social costs and benefits to reflect the true cost of an action on climate and racial justice. Organics recycling may cost us money now, but it will cost us health and lives in the future. For individuals, separating one's food scraps is one of the most practical at-home climate action items. Let's empower our communities to do so with no less than mandatory curbside collection. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Domingo Morales. Domingo, are you, are you there? <laughs> Um, yeah. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name Sorry is Dom my name is Domingo Morales. I'm 28 years old, and I was born and raised in New York City. I lived most of my life in New York City Housing Authority, and thanks to the training I received from the New York City Compost Project, I now run the Reha Compost Site, which is the largest compost site in the whole country that processes its organics using 100% renewable energy. When I entered this field in 2015, my life was changed. I was determined to become the compost expert, but the transition was difficult. There weren't many people of color in the compost sector. And when I applied for the job with the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, I didn't believe for one second I was gonna get the job because I lacked two main qualifications, a college degree and a driver's license. But thanks to the Red Hook compost site, I had seven months of intense training and I knew more about the compost process than any other applicants. Well, I got the job. And the most exciting thing for me was the fact that I would be able to train other people just like me. And I have, I've trained hundreds of youth in underserved communities, providing them professional development that gives them a fighting chance at sustainable careers, increasing diversity in the sustainability world. I have been helping to process residential food scraps in the most environmentally friendly way, turning those food scraps into finished compost that have been used throughout the city to rebuild New York City soil. Farmers, gardeners, school gardens, parks, residential gardeners, street trees, and local landscapers get our compost for free. Grow NYC and the New York City Compost Project provide these services all year round. We educate the public about food and environmental injustice. We work with students and adults of all ages and all backgrounds, cultivating, cultivating a citywide composting culture. In 2013, you, City Council, invested in the New York City Compost Project, and you were able to change the lives of thousands of people. I'm asking that you reinstate the $6.3 million for Grow NYC and the New York City Compost Project before the CORE Act is passed. The CORE Act is a step in the right direction because you now recognize that composting is essential. Composting reduces levels of methane being produced in landfills. It also reduces the amount of waste in landfills, improving the quality of life for impoverished communities who reside, who reside near said landfills. But we have already been doing this work. I ask that you fund and restore the existing programs and use the CORE Act to expand these programs, giving us the ability to serve 100% of New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jody Colon, followed by Andrea Liske, followed by Jane Felton. Jody. Starting time. I'm sorry, did you say Andrea Liske or Jody Colon? Jody Colon. Okay, here, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Reynoso, Co-Chair Cabrera, Council Member Powers, and members of the Sanitation and Environment Committee, and all the other council members for your work on this. Um, I'm very excited that the CORE Act has kept the composting conversation alive in the midst of COVID and all the budget cuts. 
I'm Jody Cologne from the Bronx, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to offer my expertise and insight to you today. Um, I was a bit surprised to hear you going forward with the Core Act as is. Equally distributed drop-off dots don't shape up into social equity when it comes to composting. And I'm speaking from my 23 years of, of experience out in the community, 18 of them as manager of the NYC Compost Project at the New York Botanical Garden, one of the seven teams funded by DSMI. It's a community-based program serving nearly a thousand organizations, agencies, and community groups across the city. That's social equity. Many have said make curbside mandatory, like recycling. Make it mandatory so the building would participate. In the Bronx, they say make drop-offs no more than a half mile away because anything else is too far away. Composting definitely needs to be more convenient, no matter what your income is. In the Bronx, there are three to seven drop-offs in most of the low-income districts. They accept only about 30 to 100 pounds of food scraps, despite being open for hours a week. Bronx sites in those neighborhoods don't waste food. They bring food scraps to places and people they care about, the community gardens where they and their neighbors do grow food. It's the same in other boroughs. To be equitable, they need hands-on help, technical assistance, and training to make compost to grow food and green their communities. I hope you'll amend intro 1942 to provide real equity. Have it mandate curbside composting within the next four years. And until that happens, let it define core sites more broadly so they can be customized to the community's needs. Perhaps staff or on staff food or yard I'm waste drop offs or maybe a neighborhood place where experts visit to provide the community with the knowledge, skills, and opportunities they need to make and use compost locally. Oh, wait, that's the mission of the NYC Compost Project. Restore some fiscal year 21 compost project funds and you've implemented some of core. Gain some of what we've lost to COVID. You've saved expertise and infrastructure and full-time green jobs with health benefits and paid time off. You've preserved the connection to the people, places, and partners that you need to start back up again in fiscal year 22. And then you also gave the time you need to craft core to take it where you really wanna go. Mandatory curbside composting and customized community composting assistance in people's own neighborhoods. Thank you so much for your time and for all your work on these issues. Uh, we appreciate that we've been able to give voice to what the people in the community are telling us. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Andrea Liesky, followed by Jane Selden, followed by Andre Coburn. Andrea? Starting time. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Andrea Liesky. I have worked with Earth Matter as part of the New York City Compost Project for six years. I've educated thousands of visitors to our compost learning center on Governor's Island during workshops, tours, work days, technical assistance, and during center, center open hours showing them the miraculous transformation of organic waste into nurturing compost to take care of our soil and plants, illustrating the importance and benefits of composting for the environment, showing them how to participate and teaching them how to compost themselves. As part of the New York City Compost Project hosted by Earth Matter, I've managed the waste operation of many public zero waste events with thousands of visitors and volunteers enabling them to learn and participate in composting, recycling, and environmental advocacy. Well, I have, let, I have been let go as of April 6th because of the city budget cuts, but this is not about me. Um, this is about New York City continuing on to address the climate crisis. It's about making the CORE Act an equitable and effective bill. Without education, outreach, and technical support as part of the bill, it will not get there. It is through education and outreach that the word compost has become a household name. And it is this wide outreach, education and technical assistance that will allow New Yorkers to participate. For some, the best way to participate might be to drop off food scrap at a location. For others, it might be through the technical assistance in their community gardens. And yet for others, it will be through hands-on exper exper um, experiences at compost sites. In-house DSNY staff will not be able to provide this at an adequate level. This work has to continue in tandem with offering New Yorkers the opportunity to drop off food um, scraps. 
please reinstate the funding for community composting and recycling outreach, make it part of CORE and pass the CORE Act. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We'll circle back to Marissa Di Dominicus. Are you still there, Marissa? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I can, yes. Okay. Starting time. Good afternoon, and thank you, Council, for this opportunity to speak. I'm Marissa D. Dominicus. I'm co founder and ED of Earth Matter New York, a nonprofit on Governor's Island. I fully support this equitable core act legislation that will provide composting and recycling opportunities for all New Yorkers. And thank you city council member Chin for your suggestion that Governor's Island be expanded as a destination for New York City food scraps. Earth Matter is ready, willing, able to work with all of our community compost coalition partners, the trust, local bid to increase our local processing capacity and achieve New York City goals. Our community composting coalition made up of Grow New York City's zero waste programs and the seven compost projects has laid off 107 community compost staff people. The fundamental educational scaffolding that New York City needs to ensure that the core act before us today is successfully implemented. They're poof, gone. I urge you to restore the budget to restore our staff and provide the infrastructure, boots on the ground help needed for our residents to drop off and educate about the future compost drop-offs proposed. Support the support system critical to help healing the environmental mess that we have made. In 1984, community organizers set up a 24 seven public food scrap drop-off center. I don't know if you can see it, but there's Oscar the Grouch and there's compost bin underneath him. It was located on East 13th Street in Avenue B, adjacent to our Green Thumb Garden. We use the compost on our block street trees and these ash trees are thriving today. We used it on our garden soils where there was elevated lead levels and it created a healthier soil. However, my neighbor and garden partner's son, James, at three years old, who played in the garden I'm expired. for severe lead poisoning that we believe contributes to his long-term health problems today. No family should worry about poor soil damaging their child's health. We request that you restore our funding immediately to show that government works together with constituents and community organizations to solve one of the city's biggest elephants in the room irresponsible and environmentally devastating waste management practices. Thank you authors of the CORE Act, council members who support these bills and especially our council member Chin for providing a legislative interim solution until mandatory recycling is enacted. Wishing you all health and safety in this difficult time. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jane Selden, followed by Andre Coburn followed by Jessica Taban. Jane? Starting time. First, I would like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jane Selden, and I'm here representing 350 NYC, an environmental activist organization focusing on local NYC climate issues. 350 NYC has joined the Save Our Compost Coalition because we recognize the vital role recycling of organic and non-organic waste plays in confronting the climate crisis. One third of the city's waste stream is composed of organic material. If composted, it has the environmental benefit of sequestering carbon. However, if it enters landfill, it produces methane, a greenhouse gas 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Therefore, we urge the mayor to restore funding for the NYC compost project and grow NYC. With the suspension of curbside recycling, the services they provide will be the only way New Yorkers can divert organic waste from landfill. Shutting down these composting facilities also means even more waste will be trucked to waste transfer stations located primarily in low-income communities and communities of color, where residents are already subjected to unhealthy levels of noise and air pollution. 
It is these same communities that have often not had access to recycling programs. The CORE Act, sponsored by Council Members Powers and Reynoso, would address the ne inequity by mandating at least three organic drop-off sites in every community district, and would also include sites for recycling textiles, which comprise 10% of the city's waste stream. These voluntary community-based programs are important stopgap measures that will keep organics recycling going during the current budget crisis. However, ultimately we need to restore curbside pickup and make organics recycling mandatory in order to make it cost effective. 20 years ago, after 9-11, plastics and glass recycling was suspended in the wake of another financial crisis and the city's recycling rate has never fully recovered. Today, we no longer have the luxury of time in ensuring, time expired. in ensuring a sustainable future. We can't afford to make the same mistake twice. Thank you. Thank you. If any council members have questions for the previous panel, they should use the Zoom hand raise function now. Next, we'll hear from Andre Coburn, followed by Jessica Tavon, followed by Ruth Asa. Andre? Starting time. Uh, thank you, members of the committee, Council Member Reynoso, Powers, Career Brandon, uh, Commissioner, and Borough President. My name is Andre Coburn. I'm from South Queens, uh, the child of hardworking Caribbean immigrants to this country, like my great grandmother who worked in cloth factories and hotels until she could open our family restaurant here in Queens, a place normally bustling in our community pre-COVID. My great-grandmother had a vegetable garden, a place that lightened the burden of what had to be bought and reminded everyone of the importance of giving back from the environment, giving back to the environment and uh, what it could give to us. I'm a passionate gardener. I'm an explosive canine officer for DHS and I am a student of the New York City Compost Projects Master Composter Program. I'm here today because although my job calls for me to risk my life to protect the public from threats, today under threat are programs like the one I am part of that bring education and power and change to my community and greener space for so many diverse kids like my daughter and her friends, and they are being cut. Programs like the Master Composter course have changed my life and opened up community gardening relationships for my peers in the community. These programs give opportunities through Grow NYC, New York City Compost Project, Earth Matters, the Lower East Side Ecology Center, the New York uh, City Department of Sanitation, and so many more help minorities in my neighborhood uh, talk and, and form these bonds. We talk about equality a lot today. People like myself asking to be seen. I ask that the council members that serve this city as well as the mayor of New York Please secure our future and see this need. We do not need another bus depot in South Queens. We don't need more police task force buildings or airport parking lots. We need programs and facilities doing green work. I think you've, you've accidentally muted yourself. Can we unmute Andre again? Me, my community, uh, value our community. We need our children to be able to see community engagement with each household in my neighborhood contributing to curbside pickup. Please reinstate organics collections. We have great food in our community, so we have great food scraps. Please support the CORE Act by first keeping the infrastructure through 1942. My great grandmother believed in teaching someone to grow and they will never go hungry. Although she passed away this year, as many New Yorkers unfortunately have. Her memory inspires me through this COVID crisis to prepare the earth for our children. Please reinstate New York Community Composting, its budget line, the funds, the education site that helps teach New Yorkers like me and my friends and family and community, the processing sites that give right back into our community with outreach and compost, empower us to be stewards of the environment by continuing to fund community composting. The infrastructure already in place with New York City Compost Project and Grow NYC is necessary for the core to be successful. Thank you again, committee members, for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jessica Tobin, followed by Ruth Asa, followed by Peter Carolini. Jessica? 
Time begins now. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I would like to thank first off uh, Council Member Cabrera, Council Member Brannon, and all the other council members for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jessica Tabone. I'm a lifelong resident of the Bronx. I was raised by Spanish speaking immigrant parents. Um, and back in 2014, I became very interested in this topic of waste management. As I saw that in my community, we were lacking in um, just engaging in waste diversion. Um, I was trained as a master composter with the NYC Compost Project. And I have volunteered since then at community gardens, events, uh, spreading awareness. Um, I was also fortunate to be hired for a green industry job with the NYC Compost Project. Um, but my job position aside, I am speaking up on behalf of myself and my neighbors. I am advocating for a restoration of the $7 million community composting subsidy, which funds the NYC Compost Project in every borough, including the one that serves my neighborhood in Bedford Park. Um, composting provides ecological, social, psychological, and spiritual benefits. Um, some of the panelists already spoke about the environmental benefits in terms of metrics. I wanna talk about a social perspective, um, about the community gardeners and urban farmers of all ages and ethnic backgrounds that are already composting food scraps, teachers that attend compost project workshops and go on to create classroom worm bins to show their students that we can reduce waste indoors as well. These students are learning that this same compost can be used to feed the soil of indoor and outdoor plants. These composting education programs foster learning, creativity, self-reliance, and more so they show our youth that they can dream and dare to ameliorate, to improve our neighborhoods, that their education is supported beyond the classrooms in our city's green spaces. So we're already uh, in the Bronx, the NYC Compost Project already engages with business improvement districts such as the Jerome Gunhill bid and Southern Boulevard bid to spread awareness of composting and do street tree care events. Homeowners and residents of apartment buildings in the Bronx such as Amalgamated Housing Co-op co have received uh, composting equipment, guidance, tricks and encouragement from knowledgeable composting staff Senior citizens get the opportunity to engage in the physical act of composting in a safe and accessible manner. They are able to contribute their labor, wisdom, and cultural history to the communities. These are some of the same citizens, senior citizens that saw these communities burn and saw, but also participated in the rebuilding of our, our neighborhoods. And their stories have inspired That's me. Inspired. And that I'm here to speak up for, for them to preserve their years of hard work, to preserve all the advocacy, to preserve all of the education and awareness that has been done in the Bronx. So that children in the Bronx who have already seen their education and school life slip on them can at least have opportunities to learn about composting and learn how they can improve their environment. Um, I guess to, to close it off, uh, we are faced with a bleak future and it requires us to reimagine and improve our waste management systems if we are to curb climate change. And we owe this to uh, the youth, we owe it to the senior citizens and all the residents of New York City. Um, and I would like to say thank you to the city council members for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Ruth Asa, followed by Peter Carolini, followed by Nancy Romer. Ruth? Time begins now. I'd like to just state a line from the book, Picking Up. Garbage is always, we will die, civilization will crumble, life as we know it will cease to exist, but trash will endure. And that's why we need to make compost, not trash. Um, good afternoon to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. My name is Ruth Rivar Issa. I'm an ICU nurse and a master composter. As a Queens resident living in the year 2020, I think it's a shame that I need to speak up about a $7 million city budget cut to an initiative that addresses social, environmental justice, and climate change impacts. On the other hand, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak up at this committee hearing to reiterate as those have before me, that the issue of organic waste removal is a priority need for New York City in the name of public health. Throughout the pandemic, I continued to do my part of backyard composting and curbside pickup until it was unfortunately suspended. 
This past year, I was also a fellow at Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. In my work this past year, I see a discrepancy that not all neighborhoods in the five boroughs are treated equally to have available brown bins for collection, neither are there available drop-off sites. This is a great time to analyze these gaps. Um, this year uh, in my fellowship program, what I see in New York is a daunting list of inequities. Aside from COVID-19 issues of healthcare access, there's issues of violence, uh, the urban heat island effects, air pollution in Southeast Queens, and the issue of waste transfer stations, primarily in neighborhoods of color. The main issue at the heart of all these disparities was what I realized is the issue irrespective of the borough, social inequality and the lack of resources. Outreach, outreach work via zero waste initiatives is invaluable. Rather than back away from healthy initiative uh, preventive actions, such as reducing waste to landfills, we need to enhance organic waste efforts. I believe this can be done by, re expired. I'm sorry, by re implementing curbside collection and promoting invaluable outreach workers. Not only should the city strengthen its efforts on maintaining organic waste removal, it should make it mandatory and widespread throughout the boroughs. It shouldn't stop there either. It should mandate that all essential places of business be held to a higher standard of waste segregation. I've worked at LAJ Medical Center as an ICU nurse for nine years, and in my whole career have never experienced such chaotic times than what is currently going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. As a frontline healthcare worker, I understand the impact that climate change also has towards long-term public health impacts. It would be counterproductive to retract such invaluable programming and one that truly makes a difference in reducing greenhouse gases such as methane. We need to be mindful as ever of our environment during these uncertain times. It's evident to me that behavior change is reality. If people can abide by stay-at-home orders and socially isolate, organics waste collection should be made mandatory. Um, I just want to briefly say also that as an ICU nurse, as a holistic nurse and a fellow at Annie, the organic curbside collection and zero waste initiatives serves as an essential in intervention to improving global and planetary health. And I ask that the city restore funding to the community composting zero waste education programs and to implement the CORE Act. Um, this past year, I have tabled events voluntarily at my hospital, uh, thanks to Queens Botanical Garden outreach workers and Big Reuse. Without their resources, without their guidance, I would never have been able to do this. And what I came across was a lot of people, a lot of employees who are interested in wanting to do more and wanting to help improve their environment. At the High School Institute for Health Professions at Cambry Heights, I helped to coordinate a composting educational session with a Queens Botanical Garden outreach worker. And what high school students see from composting goes beyond just collection. It's a method of reducing our carbon footprint and ties into local food growing initiatives. Composting provides a public health need and education, and your support would help me validate this past year's work I've done voluntarily because I see it as crucial to the future of the youth who will inherit our city. Thank you. Thank you. If any council members have questions for the previous panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Next, we'll hear from Peter Carolini followed by Nancy Romer. Peter? Time begins now. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for all those who put this together. Um, my name is Peter, and like Jane Selden, I'm a member of the Environmental Activist Group 350 NYC, offering my testimony to why I think cutting the compost program is a huge mistake. For the past year, I've been working for Earth Angel, a company that keeps film and TV sets sustainable and reduces emissions. And part of my job involves redirecting waste into compost. From my time in this position, I've seen the tremendous benefits of compost. Sustainability-wise, compost is one of our best ways to curb emissions and reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. Through our work in the past five years, on less than 30 film and television sets, we've managed to take 440 metric tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere from just composting alone. That's a fraction of what I think is achievable should millions of our residents have access to a composting program. On a citywide scale, the work that we could do in reducing emissions could be colossal. And financially, those numbers help in the long run. Like Oliver Wright mentioned, it reduces the cost of truck journeys and the loads of waste in landfill. 
And also combating the climate crisis will curb costs in the near future, costs such as seawalls for rising sea levels and costs for migrants displaced by climate, for example. A $7 million budget cut wouldn't save that much more money. As it is, this is still less than 1% of NYC's annual $92 billion budget. Long story short, the cost for compost is microscopic compared to what will be required should the climate worsen drastically. Additionally, getting rid of e-waste pickups is incredibly dangerous, and electronics and landfill is environmentally hazardous beyond compare and has been known to have horrible effects. So having seen the close up, uh, having seen up close the benefits of composting, I now ask that the funding for community compost be restored. It is a vital and money-saving process to help our great city contribute immensely to the fight against climate change in a way that most New Yorkers can join in on. And lastly, as a 24-year-old terrified of the future climate crisis, I'm begging you to vote to take whatever measure you can to ensure your descendants have a livable world. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Nancy Romer. Nancy? Time begins now. OK, thank you. Uh, Peter, thank you for reminding us of the climate crisis looming in front of us that is terrifying people who are aware. And thank you to the city council members who are advancing composting and those who are advancing a, a $1 billion cut in the New York uh, Police Department. It's a good start to reimagine what equitable public safety looks like. Um, the People's Climate Movement New York um, uh, started in 2014, uh, developing that massive climate march. Um, and we are a coalition of individuals and organizations uh, committed to mass mobilization for solutions to climate change. Uh, we recently sent uh, the city council a letter uh, signed by 180 organizations on a green recovery. And that's what composting is about. It's part of the green recovery. The People's Climate Movement of New York stands behind saving the composting program that exists right now and asked the city council of New York to expand that program to make it more self-supporting and ultimately less costly or to incur no cost to the city uh, over time. Closing down the present composting program will be costly and starting it up will be even more costly. Composting costs can be covered by expanding the program and making it more self-sustaining. The public outcry for this program can translate into broader education for New Yorkers and effective participation in the composting program now and in the future. Composting sequesters carbon in our atmosphere. Uh, putting food scraps into landfill creates methane. It's a greenhouse gas that's 86 times more potent and dangerous than carbon and creates respiratory illnesses in nearby communities. Because most waste transfer stations and landfill are in low income communities and communities of color, they will be more affected again. People's Climate Movement asks that the city council support the restoration of the $7 million in the mayor's budget to support the 170 drop off and community education sites, as well as uh, funding be restored to at least provide residents and communities with sites to drop off organic waste in the short term and immediate future. Uh, we support intro 1942 and 43, the CORE Act, to have equitable organic and textile waste collection sites in each community. What we really need is this mandatory collection at, for all New Yorkers. We need to slow down the devastating impact of climate change by supporting composting first in our communities and eventually mandatory curbside. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there's anyone who signed on to testify but hasn't been called yet, can you please use the Zoom raise hand function now? If there are any council members who have questions for this past panel, please use the Zoom hand raise function now. Seeing no hands raised, I'll turn this back over to Chair Brannon. Thank you, council. Are we all done? It looks that way, yeah. Okay, this was great. I mean, um, 
I'm reminded of that that familiar um, the familiar saying that you don't know what you got till it's gone. I mean, the amount of folks who reached out uh, to my office about losing composting was incredible, um, and it was by and large folks who live in smaller apartment buildings who don't have the space really, um, but were really really dedicated uh, to composting. I mean, when composting first came around and we saw the brown bins, people thought they had been dropped from outer space. They didn't understand what they were and they were sort of resistant to it, but they fell in love with it. They fell in love with food scraps. They fell in love with what this means. They fell in love with um, what this means for our environment. They fell in love with what it meant for the neighborhood. Um, and it was really cool to see because People really kind of hated it when, when it first happened. Where the hell am I going to put this bin? What the hell is this? And the raccoons are going to go insane. There was all these, <laughs> these crazy sort of unfounded fears about it. Um, but people fell in love with it. And, and once they got to know what it meant, um, you know, for the, the larger uh, env you know, environment, it, it, was, it was really cool to see. So the outpouring of support that we got from folks when they heard that because of budget cuts that, uh, composting was going to be sh was going to be cut was pretty impressive. It was not what I was expecting. Um, so it's it's great to see my colleagues um, uh, Antonio, uh, <laughs> Councilman Reynoso, and Councilman Powers are, are working on something that I fully support um, to try to get this back to try to salvage it somehow um, to try to salvage um, composting. Um, so um, I was happy to step in to this hearing to help chair it and to hear uh, from folks on the ground and to hear um, folks who are given such an opportunity through these programs, which is a piece that we don't think about a lot. Um, and that this was a program that was quietly very popular um, and that people are very upset that it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna get cut and we need to do what we can uh, to try to save it or, or put something together um, to keep it going through um, these harsh budget times. So thank you all so much uh, for testifying today. Uh, your testimony is very meaningful to uh, elected officials to hear what people are thinking across the city. We appreciate you hanging in there. Um, and um, with council, I can adjourn with that. Okay. Um, yeah. And with, thank you. Um, and with that, um, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>